It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Kevin Rose is here. Can't wait to talk to him. Nate Langson, tech editor from Bloomberg. He's always fun. And Lisa Schmeiser, senior editor at IT Pro Today. We'll talk about the big breach at uh, T-Mobile. Yeah, I, I got the text. And why this is going to lead to more cases of sim jacking and what you can do about it. Digital leadership on the table for Girl Scouts. Lisa talks about some of the requirements. You won't believe some of the things brownies are learning. Second graders are learning about uh, digital literacy. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk about OnlyFans. They're dropping porn. Is there anything left? It's all coming up next on Twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 837, recorded Sunday, August 22nd, 2021. The Mullet Office. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash twit. And by... Worldwide technology and Dell Technologies. With an innovative culture, thousands of IT engineers, application developers, unmatched labs, and integration centers for testing and deploying technology at scale, WWT helps customers bridge the gap between strategy and execution. To learn more about WWT, visit WWT.com slash twit. And by Wealthfront. To get your first $5,000 managed free for life, go to Wealthfront.com slash twit and start growing your savings today. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Oh, we're going to have some fun today. Some of my favorite people are with us. All the way from the UK, Nate Langson, staying up late in his secret room. Nate Langson is tech editor at Bloomberg and he is uh, also apparently a dream theater aficionado. Yeah, that I've been comes told up a lot. that all those symbols are actually barely enough to perform dream theater. Mike Portnoy back in the day, he did have more symbols than me, but <laughs> but I'm younger than him, so I I have more years to overtake. You're building a, a drum kit. Here's a here's an image of uh, Mike Mike Portnoy's. Trump kit. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be. It might be similar. It might be of a similar size these days. Yours but. are synths, though. That you're, you're, this now we're not talking bronze here. You've got uh, these. You can actually play completely silently in there, except for some thumps. Oh, it isn't silent. So, <laughs> like, it was. It was funny just before we started the show. Kevin was talking about his secret room when you build a house. I only had two requirements for this place: one, no neighbors, and two a room big enough for a giant drum kit. And they were the only two things. I let my wife decide all the rest of it. Um, because it's loud. It is loud. I love it. Great it to have... I you know, what's fun about doing this show is you get to see people in their uh, natural habitat and you get to learn a little bit about their uh, hobbies. Like Lisa Schmeiser, who is a Girl Scout leader mm -hmm. and senior editor of IT Pro today. I'm not sure which title is more important to you. <laughs> I don't like to rank them. <laughs> Someone's feelings always in the We don't have to choose. But, uh, no, I, I will say that in one of those roles, I do get access to cookies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a certain benefit. Certain so, benefit know. to that. Also <laughs> joining us, one of the original twits going back to episode zero. Uh, Kevin Rose is here now, host of the Modern Finance podcast at Modern.Finance. Hi, Kevin. Hey, how's it going, Leo? Good to be here. You were showing us your uh, your zombie. Yes, we were talking CryptoPunks before the show started. I was trying to encourage you to buy one. So I listened to Modern Finance episode one, in which you talk about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and you mentioned the original, which are these CryptoPunks. They're little, uh, basically they're icon-sized digital art. Yeah, I actually had the founders come on the show a few episodes later and talk about how they kicked off that project and how it defined what is now the standard for NFTs, which is that uh, ERC-721 uh, standard on Ethereum. So when you did that episode, this zombie was worth a couple hundred thousand? 
It was probably around that. Yeah, that sounds about right. What do you think it's worth now? It's a good question. I think the most recent sales of zombies have been around four and a half to five million dollars. Wait, now, now, what do I get if I spend four and a half to five million dollars? Do I? Do you will I- then take custody and ownership that is uh, proven cryptographically, and it'll be in your wallet, and you will have a zombie. So whichever ones are for sale. <laughs> There's only Why didn't of them. I try to buy one when I heard about him? But no, Leo said, "Oh, that's just silly." You don't have to get a zombie. There are less there there are less expensive options if you want to don't want to drop five on a on a new one. Uh, so it's way out of my price range now. It was out of my price range then, but I at least if I'd bought it then, I'd be it'd be back in my price range, I guess. Uh, I I wouldn't know a thing about NFTs or crypto if if it weren't for uh, modern finance. So thank you for doing that show. It really is great. And no, and I, no problem. And I, and people who listen to our uh, shows regularly probably know we do ads for modern finance. So thank you for buying some ads on your old podcast network. Oh, oh man, Leo, you you kickstarted my career. Oh, so yeah, I'm no, happy to return the favor with some. So, Little tiny ads. Like, thank you. If you really wanted to send a zombie along, uh, I'll be, you know, just, just uh, maybe that's the cap, just, just the top. Yeah. yeah maybe the earring. The, I don't the know. earring. Just pop off just the earring. Just pop off the earring. <laughs> Kevin was the dark tipper, something he kind of wants to live down on uh, the screensavers back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. Used to do all the little hacking tips and all that yeah. stuff. It was fun. Yeah. I, I, I look back on those days and I'm just like, that was such a special time. It really was. And even though it was only maybe 20 years ago, it feels like an eternity ago. I mean, the world has changed. I mean, what would we have thought about zombie icons worth millions in 2020? I mean, crazy. The world has changed. Let alone uh, entering the second year of a apocalyptic epidemic (laughs) Uh, or pandemic. Uh, It's just crazy. Um, I feel like Loki, you know, have you seen the show Loki? Loki's been at work. Yes. (laughs) So so I feel like we took the wrong timeline. Like we were the deviant on some like horrible timeline that we shouldn't be on. We need to be pruned and brought back to the normal one. Yeah. What the hell happened? (laughs) It's actually good for this show because the news is never uh, boring. (laughs) It's always something. (laughs) It's always something, isn't it? Just incredible. (laughs) I don't even know where to start. Um, T-Mobile admits mm-hmm. there. We talked about it last week as a speculation that uh, T-Mobile had had a massive breach. Uh, the very next day, I got a text from T-Mobile. <laughs> Were you said, compromised? I was compromised. Thank you very much. Uh, apparently, I'm not alone. Uh, here. Social security numbers, driver's license information, Everything. names, physical address. Motherboard oh, had the scoop on Vice. Uh, they said yeah. uh, that a hacker was selling uh, part of what he said was a hundred million user trove. They verified the uh, information and some of the records that the hacker was selling as being actual T-Mobile information. T-Mobile said, "Oh, we'll investigate it." That's the last time we talked about this. And then since this week, they've announced, "Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah." They they haven't said a hundred million. Here's what I got uh, on Thursday. T-Mobile is determined that unauthorized access to some of your personal data has occurred. We have no evidence that your debit credit card information was compromised. That's not exactly saying it wasn't. We take the protection of our customers seriously. We're taking actions to protect your T-Mobile account. We recommend you take action to protect your credit. And they send me a link which tells me, oh, congratulations. (laughs) You've you've just won two years of credit uh, uh, check. Checking, uh, credit reporting. Thank you very much. With McAfee. Sign up for McAfee ID Threat Protection Service free for two years, provided by T-Mobile. No, not going to do it. (laughs) Thank you anyway. Not going to do it. I guess what I'm going to do is go to the credit uh, reporting agencies and uh, put a credit freeze on my accounts. That seems like the other thing that, that's really important to remember here is a lot of people have their email backed up by their cell phone number for two factor authentication. So that can be tied to cryptocurrency accounts or whatever. So when all this information is out there, anyone can call up T Mobile and say, I'm this person. Here's right. my social security number. Sw- switch to this new SIM. I need to change SIMs. I need to change phones. And then all of a sudden, people are getting their accounts reset 
because they get uh, SIM swaps. So you, you just have to be really careful and make sure to do all your two-factor authentication on in software in something like one password or any of these you know modern password um, uh, vaults that actually support that. They did send me uh, underneath the offer of free years of two free years of McAfee uh, information about T-Mobile's uh, account takeover protection, which is specifically to avoid that SIM jacking you just uh, described. Uh, apparently, and they're not saying this, but I've seen others who said T-Mobile was saying that their PIN had been compromised. That was the thing that I did and most of us did and we were telling people to do to prevent this SIM jacking was to provide an additional PIN. Without that PIN, customer service reps could not then you know, send a new SIM to a different address, that kind of thing, making it easy to take over your account. So um, apparently that, <laughs> that PIN has been compromised as well now. What percentage and, and of people think, actually know, set that up? I'm curious. Uh, yeah, well, that's another thing. Probably very few, right? I think, Kevin, you're, you're right for bringing up the SIM swapping uh, a aspect to this because 2FA is so frequently promoted as, you know, a good idea. And it is a good idea. But you look at some of the people that have been targeted by SIM swaps. Jack Dorsey, I believe. Yes. Uh, was it a couple of years ago, that you know, on, on Twitter? Like, a lot of those hacks take place because of exactly this, SIM swapping. You just need enough detail about a person to call up and say, hey, it's me, I need to change my number, I need to change my phone, I need a new SIM, whatever. And and you are potentially rewarded with access to some very, very high profile social media accounts, very influential, huge potential. It's a massive, it's a massive problem. Twitter's uh, response to Jack Dorsey's account being hacked was to allow you to turn off SMS. <laughs> Uh, account verification and still have two-factor using a YubiKey or some other system. Uh, last uh, week, on July 23rd, Twitter revealed how many people use any kind of two-factor on their Twitter accounts. It's 2.3% of active accounts. So, it's in a way, it's an oblique answer to your question, uh, Kevin. I don't know how many people use pins on T-Mobile, but if only 2.3% of Twitter users even turn on two-factor. Uh, I can imagine it's probably a lower number than that. And by the way, of the 2.3% who had two-factor turned on, 79.6% used SMS-based mm. multi-factor. So, yeah, clearly. I'm surprised it's I'm surprised it's it's as low as that. I I, I would have assumed that you know the overwhelming majority of of people with 2FA enabled would have been SMS because it's just such an obvious thing to check. Yeah. When, you, when you're signing up or when only, you're reviewing the only, security. They make it a little hard. You have to set up SMS, and then you can turn it off later. So I wanted to use a security key, which I do. And by the way, of the 2.3% of Twitter users who have MFA, only 0.5% of that number have a security key. But that would be, the I would think, the most secure way to do it. But, you, but then you have to turn off the weak link of SMS, and you, but you can only do that once you have some other system. Uh, set up. I think an MFA app, I don't know, Dark Tipper, is an MFA app, something like Google Authenticator, as good as a YubiKey? I mean, I, it's only as good as is how you're backing up that data, right? Like, how are you going to restore that later? Like, th this, the question is, back in the day, we used to just back it up to iCloud, like some of those were yeah, big you mistake. options. That, yeah, <laughs> mistake, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So, um, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the hardware keys. I use them as well. Like I turn on, they have this thing, uh, Google has it, a, a, you can call it, it's called the advanced threat protection. Do you use um, that? Program. I tried I that. I do use that because it really I, I, disables what you, a lot of things that you would might want to do. Third party apps. Yeah. It does. A, a lot of the third party apps get disabled, but for certain accounts, like I'll, here's a great example. You have your normal Gmail account. Fine. Use a standard like two factor auth. Um, software-based two-factor auth, that's, that's great. That's your personal email. Okay, you're pretty protected. But if you have financial documents, like things that you just want to keep on Google Drive, create a separate Google account. There you and go. Have it be just for that that's probably a ultra good secure where you don't need third-party app access ever and then do the advanced threat stuff. And it really, really, truly locks it down. And it requires a hardware key in order to actually enable that. So, Unfortunately... <laughs> The Google Titan keys, which they use for that, have been compromised. But <laughs> otherwise, it's a great idea. What do you do to protect your zombie? You don't keep 5066 in a vault or something. I mean, where do you, 
it's basically it's, you just have to rely on hardware um, based. Do you have a wallet? Uh, keys. Yeah, there, there's hardware wallets out there. I'm, t- I'm testing a bunch of them right now. The two biggest ones are Ledger and, and Tezzer are the two big kind of hardware wallet manufacturers. Um, I'm using a Ledger currently, but I think the UI is just not, it's lacking and it's a little clunky to use. Um, there's a few other ones that are out there that I'm going to be trying out soon. Isn't but, Jack um, Dorsey, isn't Square doing something? I haven't seen. I feel Square like they're going to do a wallet. Okay. I'm oh, I'm sure they it. must. They know. I think they did make an announcement, something like that. I'd, yeah. he- I'd heard because yeah, obviously they do custody right now of of Bitcoin using the Square Cash app, but but they um, yeah, I haven't seen a wallet yet from them. They, 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 they they're definitely doing a hardware wallet. Yeah. Uh, the company, uh, they said in June that they were considering one. This is uh, from uh, The Verge last month. Square's going to make a hardware wallet for Bitcoin. I love how every time you see a picture of Jack Dorsey, go back to that. He looks completely <laughs> different. Yeah, like, like, well, so, sometimes he looks like a Buddhist like monk. And then other times he looks like a, a wild, like crazy, like homeless person. And other times he's like super clean cut Jack Dorsey. It's like a roll of the dice on what version of Jack Dorsey you're going to get. I particularly like how his orange tie-dye sh- t-shirt matches the Bitcoin logo behind him. Yeah. It's a very nice... Color they make crypto punks that look like him, actually. They, with the Do big they? Beard like that. Yeah, they make big beard Jack Dorsey crypto punks. You, you can I'm, have one. Look, you were an early investor. I'm sure you know Jack fairly well, right? I do, yeah. He's a, he's, I'm sure he's a cool guy, right? He's he's a very cool guy, and he's very he's super sharp, just like insanely sharp, and a brilliant kind of novel thinker. Um, yeah, I have a ton of respect for Jack. Yeah. Well, maybe his wallet will be a, a good one. He said um, he tweeted out maybe two maybe a year ago or so that he uses Tezzer right now okay. uh, as his hardware wallet for Bitcoin. So uh, this is his tweet from uh, June 4th. Square's considering making a wallet for Bitcoin. Why Bitcoin? Why not any he, He's blockchain? a maximalist, man. He's a Bitcoin maximalist to the oh, end. Oh, it's all Bitcoin all the time, huh? Yeah, he has a hard, I don't think I've seen him. I, even though uh, Twitter did do a couple of Ethereum based NFTs and he did sell one of his first tweet over uh, on the Ethereum network, he's he will not embrace any other cryptocurrencies. And I just, it, it kills me. What it's a you, missed opportunity. Uh, NFTs, your NFTs using Ethereum, right? Yeah, Ethereum is like the, the primary network. I would say 95% of NFTs are collected and minted on. And then you have other networks, Flow, Max, uh, or uh, sorry, Flow, and then also uh, Wax is another one. Um, Tezos is doing some, Solana is doing some now. So there's several other uh, cryptocurrencies that support them. Does it, uh, with it's kind of dilution of the whole idea of crypto, having so many, you know, everything from Dogecoin to Ethereum, does that not dilute the power of crypto? Shouldn't there be just one well, I mean, the way I look at it is that they're kind of just databases in the end and they have different use cases and some will be better at certain tasks than others. Like Solana is an insanely performant network. You know, it can do 50,000 transactions per second. That's a you big problem with, with Bitcoin is it's a, transactions and with are Ethereum. huge, are very slow. It's because yeah, they're using could, proof of work, right? Yeah, well, just they, we weren't designed for that. They they just they don't have the proper um, mechanics to even pull that off in terms of consensus and the way that they work. And, and you so have to have you, you have to have miners doing the work to right. to maintain the blockchain, and every transaction has to go through miners. And it's even worse now that the Chinese miners are all being shut down. Uh, transactions have gotten very slow on on Bitcoin and Ethereum, I guess. Yeah, that's why Bitcoin has introduced the, the sidechain type things like Lightning Network and Ethereum has layer two scaling solutions that take things off chain, um, but will do settlement back to the chain. So you can actually transact and do something in a more performant area and then settle back to the Ethereum blockchain. So there's there's hacks around it. Sharding is coming with the next version of Ethereum, which should speed things up quite a bit, but not a ton. So um, yeah, there'll be different, You know, some chains will support very large files. Some chains will be performance. You can do NASDAQ type transactions or Visa scale transactions. Oh, so there'll be them. different different coins for different uses, kind of. Yeah, and they're all they all talk to each other. They're the, right. all that those bridges and, and framework that is all being built out now. So they're all going to communicate. And well, swap that's why it's strange that Jack wants to make it just Bitcoin because Tezor, you could have several different currencies in that one wallet, right? And right. you could transact back and forth, and that's kind of how I think you would want to do it. By the way, uh, this is not turning into the crypto show, but I 
you know, I got the modern finance guy here, so I'm going to ask him some questions. But and I did note that Bitcoin seems to be coming back pretty strong. It's almost fifty thousand dollars again. It's pretty strong, but look, look at where Ethereum's at, thirty-two hundred or so. And Solana, Solana jumped up a ton. I think Solana is the biggest kind of up-and-comer that has the potential to take on a large chunk of Ethereum's market share. Based on it's, blockchain, it's, still yes. Yes, so blockchain, but just a, a kind of more modern novel take on how to do consensus. And that's what allows them to get that 50,000 transactions per second. They're all really low level engineers that came from Qualcomm. Um, so they they just use hardware to scale their performance. So as hardware becomes more performant, so does the, the blockchain. They're using still proof of work or are they doing proof of stake or something else? No, they do. Like it's like a proof of stake type uh, consensus. Okay. So you, you stake with validators. That's another issue, of course, is the massive energy usage of proof of work. These Bitcoin right. miners are, uh, you know, they use a lot of power. That by that's by intent, by the way. That's the way Bitcoin was designed. Proof of stake is. I hear. I don't know anything about it. I hear this on modern finance. That's where I hear it. That <laughs> proof of stake is a little bit easier on the environment. And that's what's coming with the next version of Ethereum. So that, that should okay. be out in the next like six to eight months. But they're not, they're not very good with their timelines. They've been promising side. it for a little longer than that. <laughs> yeah, but they've had, they've had some good progress. They just good. did a big upgrade about a week or so ago, two weeks ago now. Um, that was a big step in the right direction. So they're getting there. The uh, interesting thing about Bitcoin going up in value is ransomware ransoms are going up in value. Going back to this T-Mobile uh, breach, the sellers uh, selling about a third of the total number of uh, records turned for six Bitcoin, which is now a little bit more than it was a week ago. So, um, you know, I, I was speculating on the radio show this morning that, that maybe ransomware would not have gone as far and been as big a problem as it had been had there not been a way to rel relatively anonymously uh, charge ransoms. Bitcoin empowered ransomware. In the early days of ransomware, people were going to, say, sending you to 7-Eleven to buy money cards uh, because there was no really good anonymous way to do this. Once, they, once Bitcoin took off and they could expect their victims to know how to get Bitcoin and pay them in Bitcoin, it's put ransomware through the roof. It's very true. It does enable a lot of that. But I mean, Bitcoin's a really poor solution for that because everything is traceable on the blockchain. Right. So it, if they were smart, they'd be using like Zcash or some encrypted Shh, like Monero don't, or don't something. Tell them what to do. They already know. <laughs> they why they're doing don't, it. Don't, don't, talk, Tipper. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I didn't mean to leave you out, Nate and uh, Lisa. <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I find this stuff fascinating. I feel like a tourist in all of this. Mm hmm Right, Lisa? I mean, it's like yes. uh, it's like a different world. <laughs> yes. I was uh, thinking that one of the great things about tech reporting is every day, vast new vistas of things you knew nothing about will open up before you. <laughs> and then your brain gets <laughs> yeah. uh, stretched. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe OnlyFans should start taking Bitcoin. <laughs> so yeah. this is actually interesting. OnlyFans, which, as you know, really made its uh, name... Uh, with nudity and eroticism, uh, people, sex workers could create an account on OnlyFans and make a pretty good living, uh, according to a lot of people. Um, OnlyFans announced that they were going to, st you could still post nudes, but they were going to stop any explicit adult material on OnlyFans. And the speculation was this was because they were looking for investors, but an interesting tweet from Post Culture Review uh, saying a lot of people are getting the OnlyFans sto story wrong uh, the problem is MasterCard, mm -hmm. that th the credit cards are changing their policies. And uh, starting uh, October 1st, MasterCard is going to require that any site that accepts MasterCard payments not only fully verify every user and every person who appears in every adult video, but review all posted content before publication, including real-time review of live streams, the new record-keeping review processes, verification, and other requirements are expensive and time-consuming. OnlyFans seems to have decided it's not worth it. Uh, that may that I'm sure it has to do with investments as well, but that may that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it does show you the power credit card companies have. I mean, it's why ransomware never says, "Hey, give us your Mastercard number, and we, and we can just charge it." Um, 
Credit cards in the chat room. Somebody, CR1, is saying credit cards are the new church lady. I mean, this comes off the back of OnlyFans having a few problems, let's say, with underage uh, mm -hmm. activity um, and a variety of claims that people are not necessarily who they say they are on the service. And they've had to respond to that. And I, f I think the timing of this, which comes off the back of that, is probably quite significant. And I, I can't believe that it's only um, about investors and payment processes that has sort of caused this about turn, essentially. Because I think a lot of people, if you think of only th OnlyFans, they think of pornographic content or adult content. Um, I've heard there's a lot of non-pornographic stuff on there, too. Um but if that's getting lost in the bigger picture about whether there are people who are being exploited or taken advantage of in some other way, you know, it just strikes me that altogether they just said, look, this isn't worth it. Like, this just isn't worth it. Let's, we're going to move away from all this. And this is mm -hmm. just one of the reasons that they've decided to do that. Um, the the um, Twitter storm uh, po points to an October, I'm sorry, December uh, oh, op-ed piece, piece yeah, right? in yeah. Uh, the New York Times, The Scourge of Child Pornography. <sighs> Why the sigh, Lisa? No, I'm, I'm just sighing because it's it's a thorny and interactable problem and uh, interactable, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And um, if I'm MasterCard or Visa, which I am not, I'm a tech journalist, uh, if I'm MasterCard or Visa, then I'm doing everything I can to make sure that you can't put my name next to um, commodified child abuse. Right. And, um, but I would add that doesn't do anything to actually address the problem. All it does is set up alternate and parallel economies where right. this is still going to go on. <laughs> Christoph is talking about uh, Pornhub, which did lose uh, the ability to use credit cards uh, last yeah. year. Um, and I don't know how that's affected uh, Pornhub, but I imagine it's not it's not been good. And now uh, the same thing is happening uh, to OnlyFans. I'm not I have mixed feelings about this. Of course, no one wants uh, exploitation, uh, revenge porn, child pornography. There's all mm -hmm. sorts of seamy, evil kinds of adult content out there, and there's lots of demand for it. But at the same time, I don't I, 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 when Apple does what it's doing with CSAM and others, I, I get, it makes me nervous that there's a new pure, puritanical modality coming in. Uh, I, I think you take the puritanical uh, aspect out of it. I think people are actually getting distracted by the sex and eroticism angle with OnlyFans. And what we could be taking away from the story is one, credit card companies have the power to make or break an entire corporation by saying, if you want to work with us, we are going to require you to put these really labor-intensive processes into place because this protects us legally. And if your internal processes don't work, not only do you lose us as a source of funding, you're also tremendously legally vulnerable. Um, so companies now have to assess whether or not they want to do business with some of the major financial platforms in the world. But another aspect of this is the people who make money off of OnlyFans are discovering as people on YouTube discovered when YouTube started demonetizing videos or as other folks have discovered like on Instagram influencers, if you make your living on a third party platform, you're terribly vulnerable. Yeah. Because you have no say over what their their standards and practices are going to be. That's right. They don't owe you any sort of runway or notice when the terms change. Your revenue stream can dry up overnight. And we tend to valorize these stories. Um, I was reading a roundup where somebody interviewed like five different sex workers who are up in arms over the OnlyFans thing. And one of them was saying, yeah, I make $100,000 a month on OnlyFans. I'm not going to wow. be able to replicate that well. And the thing is that someone's going to see that as a success story and be like, oh, I can get them to OnlyFans. But this sex worker is not saying, I'm making $100,000 a month on OnlyFans and I'm entirely at their mercy when it comes to terms and conditions under which I can use this platform. Well, to take it out of the porn realm, my son uh, yeah. is trying to make a living as a TikTok 
guy.、Uh -huh. he, makes, oh, wow. he makes food,、uh, you know, cooking videos. They're quite good. He's very good at it.、Um, and I have the same thing. I say to him, don't be dependent on TikTok. Make sure they're on Instagram and YouTube as well. And Try to monetize all three platforms because who knows? The Chinese government might decide at any point we don't want any more cooking videos on TikTok and you're at their mercy, completely at their mercy. But on the other hand, let's not forget these platforms like OnlyFans and TikTok pro provide really, or I could we include Patreon. We sell Club Twit memberships on, on Patreon's member full site, are really wonderful, unique ways for individuals to, I think it's great. If my son can make a living, He's got 100,000 followers. His videos are getting a million, typically a million views per video. He's very close to that place where you go over the line and now you can actually make, a, you know, $10,000 a month, make a living doing videos on TikTok.、Um, those are really empowering platforms. I mean, isn't that what we, isn't that what we、uh, are excited about with social media is how they can empower an individual? Remember, it I, does, but it, it, it reminds me a great deal of,、uh, uh, you know, in a much broader sense of in the gig economy. And a lot、yes. of the arguments that went around with companies like Uber and、mm -hmm. Deliveroo and businesses where, you know, they're signing people up at, a, at an incredible pace and they're providing a product via these gig、uh, economy workers that people really value and use. But when something goes wrong, You know, there's sickness, there's injury, there's some、mm -hmm. other、um, force majeure. The company, and I don't mean Uber specifically, I mean any of these companies, don't typically have a foolproof way of protecting the people、um, that their business depends on, but also on whom they are dependent.、Uh, so there's no. There's no guarantee. There's no backup. There's no insurance policy that's very easy to get that would say, well, if you're making your living on a platform and the platform changes its terms and conditions because of payment processor influence or investor concern, or whatever, there's no insurer that I'm aware of that's like, yep, we'll cover you for that. No worry. We'll give you the $100,000 a month. Yes, a f l a c is not selling policies for that right now. <laughs> okay, but California is an at will state. Anybody working in California can get fired for no reason at any time.、Yeah. And you're, it's the same thing, right? I mean, if you're working for the man, you're working for, you're at the mercy of a third party. It's how is that different? Because, this con because there are at least contracts there, and there is this procedure you know, to, 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 to go against unfair dismissal. That,、mm -hmm. you know, there, are, there are roots that you have, and there are, there's a framework within which you can work to make sure that justice is, 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 is served if, if something has gone wrong in the system and you've been a victim of it. I don't think that exists for many of these sorts of platforms. There's, not, there's not that existing. Contractors. Yeah. Actually, that's, that's fairly timely because a judge ruled this week that、uh, Prop 22, we had a proposition in California that said uh, that uh, it was basically funded by Uber and Lyft、uh, and it was approved by a majority of Californians. Uh, voters that、uh, classified drivers and couriers as independent contractors and said it's okay,、uh, even though in the state in state law it probably was not okay、uh, because of the threat of that.、Uh, Uber and Lyft put this proposition forward. It's fairly easy in California, it doesn't take very many signatures to get a proposition out there, and then bought <laughs> millions and millions of dollars in ads. Fooled me, I'll be honest, I voted yes on Prop 22. They had a lot of、mm. nice. Moms saying, I want to be there when my kid gets home from school. I need a way to make money. I want to be able to make my own schedule. It's great. I drive for Lyft and it's a, it's a great thing. And I, I, bought, I actually bought it.、Uh, a judge has ruled now that it is unconstitutional.、Mm. In federal court on Friday, Alameda County Superior Court Judge Frank Roche said it's unenforceable because a section in the measure limits the ability of legislatures to amend the law. Boy, that tells you how smart Uber and Lyft were. When they wrote it, they said, oh, and by the way, the legislature can't override this.、Uh, <laughs> and that's unconstitutional. It's, it's lucky, that, I guess, that they did that. I still am not sure how I would vote if that proposition went up again. Because there's plenty, I mean, if you look, there's plenty of gig workers、um, who say, no, we. We appreciate the ability to work on our own schedule. They do. And I, I mean, I've been covering this for, you know, for Bloomberg for, for a number of years now and spoken to a lot of Ubers. I actually spent hundreds of pounds at one point taking rides in Ubers to specifically say, hey, I'm a journalist. Can I talk to you about this thing? And they all wanted to talk about it.、Um, and, 
in the UK, I mean, Uber's is a, a very interesting case in Britain because um, earlier this year, they uh, Uber did reclassify its drivers as workers. And there's like 60, 70,000 of them. At, uh, were that at the time. means they, ha at least in the US, they'd have to pay benefits. They'd have certain rules about uh, employment. That's right. That's right. Worker Benef protections. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not the same as classing them as an employee, you know. So there are there there is a it's kind of quite a specific definition, I think, under British law. Uh, but a lot of people looked at it and said, look, this is the way it's going to go. And if you look across Europe, there are consultations, uh, at various stages of of, of of progress where countries are saying, look, you've got to offer protection to these guys. In, it's in interesting some form. because in the UK and Europe, you have nationalized health. So one thing that is not at risk for these workers is health care. In the United States, that might even be the biggest issue for these workers because they, of course, don't get health care when they're contractors. In in the UK, in the UK, certainly, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's real. I think that's has... interesting. It's still an issue in the UK, even though health care is not on the table. But health care, you know, there there are gradients of health care. I mean, yes, we have we have free health care. Anyone here gets, you know, doctors and medicines. It, it's it's taken care of it's free if, if you need it or, or heavily subsidized but that doesn't necessarily entitle you to extremely quick um uh being seen very quickly or if you have an emergency obviously that's that's different but if you've just got something that kind of needs doing you still end up on a waiting list you're not going to pay for it but you're still on a waiting list whereas private healthcare, usually you know you're seen very very quickly um and a lot of companies do offer that sort of um uh -huh. perk so that would and be that's, that's that would be a benefit here. of employment is better is better healthcare. Yeah. yeah, and things like holiday, you know, vacation time as well. Um, the way that Uber did it, I think, is that you know you you get a certain number of hours paid to you um, in lieu of having the days that you can take off because you're working your own hours. So it's more like well, we'll give you a percentage, like over the course of a year. If you're working full time, you may have had this many days paid vacation. So we'll take that as a percentage and just apply that as sort of like a, a cash bonus on top of whatever hours you do. So it's not like you're getting the days as paid holiday. It's more like you're getting the money that you would have had based on how much you're driving, if that makes sense. It is really complicated and it's quite specific to Britain at the moment. I'm very conflicted about this because on the one hand, I... I I think it's it's a it's a modern way of employment, gig employment, and people don't have to choose it. That's I guess the fundamental crux of it. Do people choose it because they have to? There's no other option out there. Just like Amazon warehouse workers have to take a bad job because there's no other option. Or is it a fairly fluid labor market? Could they take a better job? Uh, in which case, they're choosing this gig work, maybe for good reason. Well, let's go back to that ad you cited where you talk about how in the ad there was the mom who said, I wanted to be there for my kids every day. One of the appeals of any sort of gig economy hustle is the idea that you do have control over your time so that you can, especially if you're somebody who is responsible for caregiving either a parent or a child, so that you can balance the demands of your personal life against the very real need to make money. Um, I suppose you could argue that they took the job because they had to, um, since being able to control when and how much you work is going to be a huge priority to people. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the modern the world is tough. The flip side of that, of course, is the, <laughs> the flip side. Of, the fl the flip you. side is that it's sold as this: oh, you have total control over your time, but that's almost like, oh, the good news is it's a flex flexible schedule. Yeah, go ahead and work any 80 hours a week you want to work. Because, yeah, yeah. um, you know, you, you just like you mentioned with your, your son who's on TikTok, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing a rise in the number of articles talking about TikTok influencer burnout where these kids were like, I, I just have to keep... Exactly. Yeah. And with these... But it's his choice to do it. Well, with these gig economy type jobs, it's the same thing where the risk of burnout is real. And one of the hazards of being an independent contractor is if you don't have any sort of built in benefits, you can't take a two week paid vacation and you can't take a sick day. And you may not have a boss who's forcing you to go to a webinar to tell you how to not to get burnt out. <laughs> um, in the, in but, the old days before uh, whatever happened to our politics happened, uh, mm -hmm. this was the kind of thing that would divide Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Democrats would say, no, no, you got to protect workers. Republicans would say, no, it's their choice. It's free choice. 
Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't like it, get another job. And I think that's a, that, that is a debate that is a, not an unreasonable debate. I don't know where I come down on, mm -hmm. on that. I understand both sides uh, of the issue. Uber and Lyft, by the way, say that this is outrageous. <laughs> they, will appeal, they will appeal the uh, judge's uh, decision. Um, One of the things that I, I just wanted to mention on the OnlyFans front, because um, I forgot to mention it earlier, is that the pandemic has made that platform, that's, and specifically that platform, um, very popular for a large number of people who were suddenly out of work or had a lot of spare time on their hands and have made good money during the pandemic as a result of basically being stuck at home but having an outlet for something they can do at home. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder how many of those people during the period of time that they have now been at home, because let's be honest, this has gone on for a, an awful lot longer than anyone of as it looks, it probably and looks would. like it's going to go on even longer, by the way. How many of them had got to the point where maybe they started doing something and thought, maybe this can support me, maybe it'll just be for a couple of months. But over the course of the prolonged period of the pandemic, is they've actually said, you know what, I don't need to go back to work. Like, mm -hmm. I don't need furlough. Like, let's just go all in on this. This will keep me. And then this happened right and now they're out of money potentially and they're out of work as well i don't know i just think there, there will be a quite a few people that will fall into that category it's complicated and again, right I, there mm -hmm. it's yeah. hard to know where to come down on this and you've studied it a lot more than i have you have direct contact with uh, drivers i mean i have anecdotal contact with drivers um and of course you yeah. can't really trust somebody who's doing it because they have some investment in justifying the fact that they're doing it even if it's a terrible you know gig for them they're they might be more inclined to say it's good just because they just to justify the fact that they are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't know. A DoorDash's minimum guarantee is sixteen dollars in an hour plus thirty cents a mile. That sounds pretty good. That's, that doesn't sound like a bad gig. I just don't know. I would ask um, with the DoorDash gig, what happens if a customer is dissatisfied, or right. are you required to eat the cost of a meal if a customer's like, "This isn't what I ordered," or it seems like. It's one we thing a, to say you're making 16 bucks an hour. I would question what sort of protections are there for dealing with just difficult customers? We have a uh, local food delivery service called the Petaluma Food Taxi that mm -hmm. recently has had to ask people, do not withdraw your tip yeah. <laughs> uh, after you get your food. So apparently what people are doing is saying, I'm going to give you a 30% tip. And then after they get the food, they, they cancel the tip as a way to get and send a good delivery but then that the but then they don't the driver gets nothing and i thought that's so low but of course people are going to do stuff like that mm -hmm. yeah but if you work with the public you you know in any capacity you have to deal with that i don't care if you're working at starbucks or or uh, an uber driver um kevin i actually wanted to ask you about uh cory doctorow's assertion that uber never was intended to make money, that it was all a, a con. But let's take a break and then we'll, we'll do that. Kevin Rose is here from the Modern Finance podcast, Modern.Finance. Of course, he's a famous angel and uh, VC, angel investor and VC at uh, True Ventures, formerly at Google Ventures, and an angel before that, and even maybe more famous as my personal friend. So it's so nice to have you on the show. Two kids now. Two little ones, three-year-old and two-year-old. Oh my! Keeps me busy. That is, those are that's two little bundles of energy. <laughs> Holy yeah. cow! I'm right Holy in the thick cow. of it, right? <laughs> Holy cow! Is Daria with him right now, or? Yeah, upstairs, yeah. and like you just never know when I'm doing these podcasts, you know, because I do a few a week. It's like, okay, what roll the dice am I going to get today? I'm going to get a screaming baby that I have uh -huh. to text, you know, Daria, be like, take to the other side of the house. You know, <laughs> I, uh, I, when my kids were that age, I had my own office, but they would, they knew I was in there. They would come and pound on the door, <laughs> and say, "Daddy, Daddy, let me in." <laughs> but I noted that you actually have a secret room. This is a secret. Yeah, you can't see because of the lower third, but there's a little tiny like knob there, like a little twisty thing <laughs> that uh, allows access to the room. You're so actually behind is... a bookshelf, so they don't know you're in here. That's correct. And they are also, yeah, they're, they're, we have a, a child gate that keeps them from coming downstairs from the stairs there, so that's that's good as well. Lisa, have you ever had trouble like that with your daughter? <laughs> she pounded on the door. 
<laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so there was one time I was recording a podcast with Jason Snell over at The Incomparable when she was teething and she screamed so loudly we had to suspend the podcast until she could calm down a little bit. <laughs> wow. Wow. And I was like, oh, but I mean, she's one, she's 10 now, so it's much easier. Yeah. And two, um, I arranged a mini golfing date for her, so it's not going to be a problem. Today. Oh, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like putt putt golf when you got to do a podcast. That's the key. It's outside. It's safe. <laughs> can I can I embarrass Kevin? This is a uh, little video. Oh no! From uh, the new screensavers. Maybe it's more embarrassing to me. Your Windows password is not very secure, especially if they have physical access to the machine. Oh man, That's my brown hair. You're so cute. Enough. Let me show you. Let me give you a little background on Windows password. Are you gray now, Take Kevin? This right here. Uh, look at this. I've launched the command shell. Yeah, this is a lot. Kevin, you're almost the Windows age I was when I'm talking right to you right now. Here. That's right. This is where Windows passwords oh, are stored. They're my stored God. Right inside your Wait, how, Leo, how old were you then? Um, that Sam let's file see. This was uh, probably nine. Let's say it's nine. Let's say it's 2000. I would have been 44. No, this is 2002. 2002, so 46 or 45. Okay. So you're getting close. How old are you? Yeah. 44. Yeah. So you're you're basically the age I was when we first met at Tech TV. That's amazing. And this kid, he's the age of my kid now. How about that? How about that? That's Henry's age. Yeah. It's completely free. It's a Linux. This is a password. We were hacking, hacking, uh, hacking NT passwords there. Yep. Yeah. I think it's. It sounds a little sped up. I don't think your voice was quite that high. I think I was really nervous is what I was. I was like just talking super fast. So much fun. Uh, sorry, I hate to do that to you, but I have to do it to you every single oh, it's time. It's always fun. It's like a little brother. You got to just give him a little noogie every once in a while. Yeah. Who's boss? Our show today brought to you by Mint Mobile. Love these guys. Man, did I get a great deal from Mint Mobile. So uh, Mint Mobile is a wireless company that is a lot like any other wireless company you used to. After years of you know, fine print contracts getting ripped off by big wireless. If we've learned anything, we know there's always a catch. You know, they they say uh, unlimited download, unless you download so much, we're going to have to turn it off. Or, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the data price is low, low, low. <laughs> no, no, no. When I heard Mint Mobile, for instance, was offering premium wireless service starting at 15 bucks a month, I said, no, you know, that that what's the catch? Where's the fine print? But you know what? I've been using their service now for more than a year, and it's true. There is no catch. See, Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that the first company to sell wireless service online only. No retail stores, no crazy overhead costs that you have to pass down to you in the form of mystery fees. It's just that it's just the best. They offer premium wireless starting at $15 a month. Now you get four gigs a month, unlimited talk and text with that. But they have an unlimited plan for $30 a month. It just depends how much data you need. All the plans come with unlimited talk and text. High-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can bring your own phone. They'll send you a SIM free. The other guys actually charge you to send you a SIM. And uh, they'll make it easy to port your number over so you don't have to lose your number. If you keep using your old phone, your contacts come right along with it. Uh, I got a, Actually, I went online and got one of their uh, iPhone SEs. For 15 bucks a month. So that meant 30 bucks a month. I got a brand new phone and f service. 30 bucks a month. That's about a third of what I'm paying for just the service alone on the big boys. And of course, if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their seven day money back guarantee. Shop around. You will not find a better plan for your cell phone. Get it for yourself, get it for your family. Switch to Mint Mobile Premium Wireless Service, just 15 bucks a month. See the calculator there? Use that. Bring your bill. You can you could figure out how much data you use on your current plan, and you can easily figure out uh, how much Mint Mobile will save you. I can promise you it's going to be a ton. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and uh, get the plan shipped to your door absolutely free, no charge, go to mintmobile.com slash twit. Please go to that address so they know you saw it here, Mintmobile. Dot com slash twit. As a very happy Mint Mobile customer, I have to ask the burning question, why the hell am I paying more for less? Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month. Mintmobile.com slash twit. I can highly recommend them. And I do. I do. My uh, father-in-law, everybody I know, has <laughs> got them on Mint Mobile. So, um... 
Cory Doctorow made an interesting assertion in his blog, Pluralistic.net, a couple of weeks ago. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get Kevin on here. He's an investor. He can explain what the hell's going on. Uber, Corey says, was never going to be profitable. It lured drivers and riders into cars by subsidizing rides. As we know, uh, Uber loses money on every single ride, something like 40% on every single ride, no matter what they pay the drivers. Uh, subsidizing rides with billions and billions of dollars from the Saudi royal family, big investors, keeping up the con artist's ever-shifting patter about how someday this will all stand on its own. Like the pretense that self-driving cars would eliminate all their labor costs. They knew this would never happen. They spent billions on a doomed effort, then had to bribe another company with a $400 million investment to take away its window dressing. Uh, Uber's whole game was to get investors to put in money all the way up to the IPO so that Uber could, you know, founders could cash out, walk away, he says, whistling innocently. Um, and by the way, there's been a side effect to this because Uber has also made cities more hostile to bicycles mm -hmm. uh, by turning bike lanes into Uber drop-off and pick-up spots. They've increased traffic in midtown Manhattan and other big cities. They've, maybe even worse, they've increased, in effect, encouraged uh, local governments to not consider mass transit options, to just say, well, we got Uber. It victimized workers, riders, cities, and even restaurants. Uh, quite famously, Uber was kind of predating upon restaurants, using SEO to trick people into thinking they were ordering from restaurants directly, non-consensually opting restaurants into its delivery service, subsidizing meals to set prices below break-even. And then once Uber had diverted a restaurant's customers into relying on its service, this is really accelerated during the pandemic, it put the screws to restaurants, forcing them to pay, quote, marketing fees upon pain of having searches for their business diverted to Uber-affiliated ghost kitchens. Um, it raised more than $200 million to pass Prop 22. Uh, and it never has ever made money. It's, made, it's lost money like crazy. Every quarter it releases, this is Corey writing again, new lies laid out like a profit and loss statement, non-GAAP accounting, and every quarter it's losing money. In fact, according to Corey, mid-2021, Uber is going broke. Uh, not a lot of runway left. True accounting of the last quarter has Uber losing 38 cents on every dollar it took in. 3.7 billion of its assets are actually worthless paper from failing overseas ride hail companies. Cash reserves declined by 4.7 billion in 2020 and 937 million more in the first half of 2021. They've only got 6.7 billion in the bank, down from 14.6 in 2019. What do you think, Kevin? Uh, I don't. I don't know if you have an investment in Uber. I hope you don't. It, was this just a, a con game, a shell game? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have an investment in Uber. I, I was there uh, when we did the investment at Google Ventures. So we we did place a very large check, uh, two hundred fifty four million dollars into Uber when I was at Google. Um, they, I, I can tell you this because I was, I, I knew the founders from the very beginning. Um, you know, Travis and Garrett and, and, um, Ryan, it, they did not, they're not scammers. I mean, they, they, they set out to build a real business here and they started off with just black car service when it first launched. And so, you know, when you're in San Francisco, we were all using it just that there was a handful of black cars and we're like, Oh, cool. Kind of date night. This is an awesome way to like go out on a date, you know, and, that and was the black the idea. cars were, were more expensive. In fact, I remember taking it when they launched, I think you were there in low web when they launched in Paris it was a black car service. It was nice. It was like, a yeah, so it was expensive. There, there was no, so you, when they first launched, there was no, like any other option. You right. could only start with black cars and that's all they did. And they were like, okay, we're going to make it easier to book a black car. That, that's what they thought, like a cooler, like higher end car. And so what happened though, is that the second that started to work, then there were a, a, a handful of other startups that entered the space. And the second these other startups entered the space, they did two things. One, they said, okay, this doesn't have to be just applicable to black cars. It can be any car. And so, you know, Lyft was really famous to come along with the, the mustache and yeah. saying it's all about fist bumps and we're a cooler By the way, I, I have to <laughs> confess my nephew invented the mustache. Okay, go on. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> you got to pull that up so that people can see what we're talking about. They might not remember the, the giant mustache. giant pink Aww. mustache on Lyft cars. You couldn't miss them. <laughs> 
It was fun. Uh, he was the uh, director of uh, customer, um, I feel like it was customer experience, something like that. But uh, they, I was fun. In fact, it made me want to take, take a, here's a picture of, a, of an Audi uh, mm -hmm. with a giant pink mustache. Yeah, they all had the mustaches on. Yeah. But, but so when this came out, essentially what happened is now you have two well-funded companies or multiple companies that had venture funding. And the they saw this as a massive market. So venture capitalists just poured tons and tons of money into these startups. And the only way to really win was to reduce margins and like reduce the, the cost. Oh, my dog's going to throw up in the background here. That's Everyone, okay. Hi, Toaster. Okay, the toast? only dog with an Instagram filter named after him. Poor guy. He's Poor like, guy. And he's now a little ill. On a moth ball. Yeah, he's like 10 years old now. So, um, yeah, so basically margins got compressed and more money. Uh, and then all of a sudden, every ride was unprofitable. And, you know, it was just a scale. Let's, let's go for scale. So massive marketing budgets. And then you have consumers where if they would raise rates, they would just drop off and go to the competition. So if, if Uber was trying to get a little bit more margin, all of a sudden, everyone would just go over to Lyft. And it was just nasty battle that went on and on. Um, and they just haven't gotten out of that battle. And it's just, there, there's no kind of way out of it. It's, I, I don't, I, I'm with everyone else here and that I don't see a path forward to these be becoming profitable entities. Uh, yes, the margins on things like Uber Eats look a lot better. Um, yes, self-driving technology is, is coming, but it's not there yet. I mean, I still think we're another decade out until we're going to have something that other than just neighborhood trips, but like actually highway and on and off ramp and side streets, like it's going to be a while until that technology is ready. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I don't hold any Uber shares right now. Yeah. It's not incompatible. Corey's thesis is not incompatible with the fact that Travis and company had good intentions at the beginning. These things can run away from with you. Oh, and there was a ton of shady stuff that went down. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Like <laughs> Travis, his, uh, Travis is, um, He's ruthless. He is a ruthless, hardcore competitor. And he's got that kind of like drive in him that he will do anything and everything to win. And that was, um, that just was unfortunately not the way to run that business. Yeah. And it, it really created a toxic culture internally. And a lot of these business units did some really shady things to win at all costs. And, um, you know, Travis is a very smart man, but, but he's also just like, it's like a lot of these CEOs that you hear about that are just brutal, the brutal, you know, there's, there's a lot of fortune 500 CEOs. They, they, they get that way because they're just so cutthroat and that's chainsaw um, yeah. Al Dunlap comes to mm -hmm. mind. They call him chainsaw because he, because he was the king of tearing up a company. By the way, this is not my nephew. I, I got it wrong. It's my cousin, Ethan Eiler who was, he's currently, I didn't know he's still there, head of brand products at Lyft, but back when he was uh, the director of ride experience in Lyft, he invented the car stash, the glow stash, and amp. So That is so awesome. Yeah. He also developed an internal platform allowing for the scalable execution of in-car experiences, such as taco mode with Taco Bell and the mini van mode with Disney. So there you go. My it was so much more fun back then. Do you remember it when was. They, they used to have a puppy day? Yeah. Where they would like bring puppies to you yeah. and you could like request a, a Uber or a Lyft that was like filled with little puppies that were up for adoption or whatever. Like they just had a lot of fun with it and then it just became nasty. I feel like this is all part of that thing you were talking about. We just took the wrong Loki timeline. Yeah. <laughs> we did. <take> the wrong <laughs> and everything was fun has now turned sour. Um, I guess there's a precedent for that. I can remember... I'm old enough to remember the summer of love in 1967, which went south in Haight-Ashbury with uh, the advent of methamphetamine and other stuff, and people just became ugly. Um, that's not, I guess it's human, human nature. It all, de it all, it all declines after a while. Um, all right. I don't know where to go after this. I, I, <laughs> there's so many directions. Should we? I don't want to bring back the CSAM discussion, but we've got two parents here. We've got a Brit. Uh, I'm I always. I, this is one of those Apple things that th at first I thought, you know, it seems like a pretty good idea. I heard from a lot of people, especially experts 
in uh, in this kind of uh, perceptual hashing who said, that's eh, not such a good idea. Uh, people like the EFF who said, you know, Apple could be coerced by other governments to add mm. this kind of fingerprint technology for other kinds of imagery. Um, now I don't know what to think. So new week, new panel, new bunch of people. Let me... Let me start with you, Nate. What's the, I mean, this is a very different discussion in the U.S. than I imagine it is in the U.K. Um, I'd say it's, I, from what I've read and the people I've talked to, the arguments are broadly very similar because it all boils down to two or three core things. Well, you have the um, Peepers Charter, right? There's Snoopers Charter in the UK. We've we've had we've had a variety of things uh, over the years proposed and watered down. Um, what the government here or many members of the government here want is 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 backdoors. Right. You know, they want ways to break encryption. They want to be able to say we need to see the content of somebody's uh, WhatsApp messages. So Facebook, you need to build uh, a backdoor so we can do that. And obviously the companies all push back for very similar reasons. As, as Apple says, you know, they, this this is your device, these are your messages, it's, keep us out of it. Um, that's that's one side of this. I think the other side is, um, is mission creep. You know, I, I, I haven't heard of an argument yet that I've, well, I, I can't even think I've heard of an argument of someone saying Apple um, shouldn't do anything to help prevent um, CSAM, um, the argument that that people have put forward is that it's a slippery slope, or you know, you're opening the dam to to say, well, you did it for this, so let's let this government um, have its influence um, and, and create another backdoor. And I'm not buying that. I, I don't. I don't believe that would necessarily be the case. But the argument that I do buy is that as we've seen with the likes of piracy, when a company puts in uh, something like this as a policy or as a framework, it just forces the people who would be caught out by it to do something else. To, you know, whether that's forcing underground or just turning off iCloud photos, whatever it, the, the solution they seek is, um, it doesn't necessarily um, create the... Um, the atmosphere that, 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 that the good intentions think that it, it should. It just pushes people to use something else. Um, and that's why I, I kind of agree that it's probably not the right way um, to do it for all the reasons that the privacy campaigners, and we've seen dozens and dozens now of, 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 of groups and of experts and people saying, look, this is not the way to go, and this won't serve the good that you, that you think it will. Um, I've actually seen some people say that Apple's and the iPhone's, Apple's devices were considered a haven for CSAM because Apple was so reluctant to do any scanning. They only reported 256 uh, incidents of child pornography on uh, iCloud Drive uh, last year when Facebook reported 100, what was it, 125 million. Uh, but Facebook scanning, but, but Facebook is able to scan those in the cloud on its own servers so it would it, it you know most most of these um companies that that do report much greater numbers are doing so because they are scanning every image or they are using ai and to detect honestly problems. i wouldn't object to apple doing that on their own servers they they have every right to say as a company we will not be hosting this kind of material um, but they're not proposing to do that and i think what i suspect apple is up to is that apple wanted to do end-to-end -end encryption on iCloud mm. precisely because the FBI and, and the UK demanding to access the iCloud. In fact, we know they can right now. They even told the uh, San Bernardino uh, shooter, oh, it's a mistake. You, you shouldn't have let that phone lock. You should have just brought it back to his house. It would have uploaded to iCloud, and then we could tell you exactly what was on that phone. Apple's never hid the fact that they have the keys to iCloud storage, but I think Apple's had, has wanted to encrypt it, and I think it's possible that what Apple said is, before we do that, we better come up with a way f to say, oh, no, but we're making sure there's no child pornography on there. The only mm. way to do that is to scan on ingress. And the only way to really do that is to put it on the phone, scan it before it's uploaded, and that's, in fact, that what they've implemented. I'm not... I don't have any inside information. I don't know if that's what Apple was planning, but it would kind of make sense to me that that would be 
they would do this before they would announce end-to-end -end encryption on iCloud. Um, and I think they have every right to scan iCloud. Is it, do you, Nate, do you think the problem is that the scanning is done before it goes to iCloud? I think the problem is that it, well, part of the problem is that I, I don't think it's scanning in the same way that we, that we traditionally think of scanning. You know, when you think of scanning, you think of an image uploaded, uh, algorithms are run over it, and somebody, well, a machine is determining the content of the image. That's not quite what's happening in this sense. It, it's more that the hashes, you know, the fingerprints of right. those mm -hmm. uh, of I previously identified CSAM material is on your phone. And if something on your phone, uh, the, if the result of the hash mash, matches and enough of them match, then it's flagged. So it's not... But, but only on like, upload. Like, they, Apple said very specifically, if you turn off iCloud Photos, if you do not attempt to upload this imagery, it will not be scanned. That's right. That's right. But but I believe that just means that you know that it's not being sent to Apple. I don't think it necessarily means that the that the potential to identify is uh, removed from. They the have device. that capability. That's right. No, they would still have it, the capability. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you know Apple made a bit of a mistake in announcing it when it did uh, alongside the um, the messages feature right. that, that I actually think is a good idea in many, many ways, which is, you know, if, 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 if the um, child using a phone that is under restriction, you know, with the parental controls switched on, uh, if it looks like somebody is sending something that looks harmful, then it is blurred out and a parent is alerted. Right. Um, that's a very different method of scanning and identification uh, that is using a much more, I don't want to say sophisticated system, but it's its its using something that is detecting brand it's, new, never before seen images and saying, hey, right. this might be something you want to take a look it's at. It's also more prone to false positives, I think, because of the nature of what it's doing. We, let me, let me yeah. ask you, uh, uh, Lisa, because you're the parent of a preteen. <laughs> yes. Would you turn this on on, your, on her iPhone? Well, I, bold of you to assume I'm letting her have an iPhone. Um, <laughs> well, actually, that's part of the conversation, right? That's part of the conversation yes. because yes. giving her um, an iPhone opens up a whole range yeah. of possibilities. Yeah. The, um, so you haven't done that? that? No, no, not yet. The advice I got from somebody um, who put it in very stark terms is they were like, you realize the minute this kid gets an iPhone that she'll be watching porn. And I was initially appalled by that. But what they were basically suggesting was once you give somebody a device that has access to the internet, you've ceded some form of control over what they're finding and how they find it. No matter how carefully you set up safeguards, there's always a way to work around them. And kids do pull this information. So I had to be comfortable with her level of digital literacy and what kind of risk she was going to be exposed to. And right now, I'm not comfortable with that. So right. she doesn't have an iPhone. It strikes um, me that that's not Apple's mm -hmm. job per se to protect them from that. That's your job. Yeah. To well, have that conversation. It. You wouldn't want Apple to replace your... Uh, exactly. In parento, um, lo lo in whatever in parento lo in loco parentis. Loco yeah. parentis, yeah. Yeah. Um, the... the um, I'm going to repeat a variation on what I said with OnlyFans, which is you you can take the exploitation or the prurient content or, content, or in this case, the, the CSAM out of it and take a look at what the issue that's got everybody worked up is, which is that Apple wants to put a technology, uh, Apple wants it, on your phone, which purports to address a social problem, but also allows other actors a tremendously high degree of control over your online, over your over your networked activities. Um, I do think it's notable to to point out that right now it's CSAM, but if it's in other countries, what's to stop Apple from saying, "Oh, fine, you know, we'll flag any pro democracy." memes or or rhetoric that comes on and you'll be able to see which users are sharing well, but that. here's the here's the question at least from apple's point of view is mm -hmm. you haven't bought a, an iphone for your daughter yet w yeah. would it help apple's asking you would it help if we gave you this switch so that you would know if uh bad stuff was being texted to her or vice versa would that help 
Because that's what Apple's assuming is, well, yeah. this is going to make it more well, it, it, parents more comfortable with giving an iPhone I feel like that's kids. a technological solution to what's actually a social problem. I agree. Uh, the same way, if you take a look at CSAM, a tremendous amount of the exploitation happens with people that are in the children's social circle, either yeah, families family or friends. the wider community. Yeah. And there's no amount of technology that can go up against those really fraught and complicated familial and social situations. I mean, we've seen how it plays out when um, children who were abused by trusted community organizations, you know, when they come forward, we've seen how it, it's horrible. Just, it's horrible. Exactly. Yeah. And there's no technology that's going to address the person to person in person to person, real time meet space, social interaction. Um, what, I, I could see where if Apple was saying what we're trying to do is we're just trying to prevent spreading this content and perpetually revictimizing somebody. Um, but they kind of overreached a little bit in the pitch and they're not doing a darn thing to address concerns like how, how are you handling false positives? How would you be handling malicious attacks if somebody is trying to frame somebody else digitally? And what reassurances do we have that this type of technology can't be used to restrict any type of content your customers demand? Right. Um, right. None of those questions have been answered. So, <laughs> Kevin, you don't have to worry about this for some years. <laughs> <laughs> got a few years. Yeah. You got a few years. Believe me, it goes faster than you think. <laughs> um. Would you, I mean, if it, you know, ten years from now your kids want a f smartphone, would it be reassuring to know this technology is built into an iPhone? Yeah, I mean, I I think so. I would like to be sent that in just terms of allowing me to have a conversation. You know, I hope. Yeah, you to don't have to uh, turn that, that on. By the way, parent does not have to turn mm -hmm. that on. That's up to the parent. Yeah, I mean, I would I I would like to have be notified so that we can just talk about it. Right. You know, I I, I want to be one of those open and kind of uh, parents where no topic is off limits, and so hopefully yeah. that would just be something we could have a conversation around. So, I, I, it's my suspicion that the same kind of perceptual hashing they're looking for nudity in inbound and outbound text messages could easily be applied to websites. Of course it could. Any image is coming into the phone. Well, a lot of routers do that today, right? right. They tell you they have child protections and they can know if they're going to certain sites and things of that nature. Historically, yeah. uh, tools that look for nudity have been very, uh, have a huge false positive problem. They're not very good. And false negative, frankly, problem. They're not very good at this. But let's say Apple comes up with a good form of uh, perceptual hashing that can find sexual images and Lisa, that might solve your uh, qualms, right? Because it would then do the same thing with an inbound por uh, pornographic image on the web. Would that would that be a good thing? Would you turn that on? Mm. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to see how it works. It's first. Interesting. It's challenging, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, again, I'm innately skeptical of technical solutions that are treating social interactions like a series of data exchanges. Right. Because on one level, yes, when you converse with somebody, you are exchanging data. When you text somebody, you're exchanging data. But there's always a cloud of, you know, emotional and social and cultural expectations around those things. And that's where, as a parent, you really do have to do the work. It'd be nice if the tech tool helps you do the work, but I don't think right. that substitutes for being present and being hands-on. I agree 100%. And, and, Yep. taking it case by case. Yep. Actually, it's funny because, Nate, I kind of am the opposite of you. I, I don't mind mm -hmm. scanning for stuff on iCloud. Apple has every right to say, I don't want, we don't want any child porn on, pornography on iCloud. Mm -hmm. I don't like the on-phone scanning. Um, and you, you're kind of the other way around. Uh, am I? I'm I not. Even, I, I mean, I'm, 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 uh, that is a, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I'm not in favor of implementing a system that is a, you know that basically it it, it largely i don't want to say punishes it um it it's, assumes wrongdoing yeah on people who are behaving themselves and for all the people who aren't they just they'll just remove themselves from Right. being subject to it in the first place right. that's I, i'm i'm in i'm in favor of 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 if you know if you're putting something in the cloud if you're uploading something you're sharing something i'm, I'm in favor of of, of that being caught 100 yeah. percent. yeah um, but you're not sharing it though really you're just backing it up though right 
That's right. Wait, you wash? You're putting but it on I, Apple's I, cloud, but you're not necessarily giving it to anybody. You're just putting it on their cloud. But I think it's Apple's I, right to say, hey, we don't want that stuff on our cloud, and we're going to scan everything you try to upload. I think it's also interesting that ch they chose to do that on device, and I think they did that for some technical reasons, including perhaps their desire to go end-to-end -end encryption on iCloud. Well, I think, honestly, That's what right. they should do is they should come in and say, listen, we're going to, and this, I know there's a lot of devil in the details here, and this is this is just a hardcore approach, but you could say, okay, we do want to address child pornography. We're going to scan everything that is uploaded in the cloud, right? So they have, that means that they have the private keys because they can go in there and look through your files. I know they're doing hash comparisons, but like they're still looking and seeing the different files and files. They types, chose right? not to do that though, right? That's no, the, I know, that's but the point. Mm -hmm. No, but what I'm saying is if they decide to do it globally, then you can say, listen, I'm someone that actually cares more about the privacy of my photos. Scan it on device all you want. Look for the child porn on device, but encrypt everything in the cloud so right. that no one has access to it. In the I cloud. think that's what they're going to do. That's my prediction. Well, I, but do both, right? Like, yeah. and you can that way you can say I don't want the on device scanning, just do the cloud scanning. Mm -hmm. And but if I do want everything encrypted in the cloud, which I am a fan of that, you know, I have photos of me and my yeah. wife like a, during no childbirth should, and like no stuff. No one should have access to anything. Have access, yeah. Right. So they encrypt all that and look for child porn. Fine. I'm fine with that, you know? Right. But I, I want that cloud all encrypted so that no one, not even Apple engineers, could see it. That's how it should be. Now, I should point out Dropbox, I, I agree. Facebook, everybody who has cloud storage, Google, uh, does in fact use this NECMEC image database and does the fingerprint scanning. Uh, because they also don't want to have this image re on their storage. Google even does it to Gmail attachments. Uh, and, and it's been doing it for a long time, and, and it hasn't raised any hackles. Go ahead, Nate. You said you and, agree. Yeah, I, I just, I agree. I agree 100%. And I, I just think that there is no perfect way to do this. And of all the technological ways that I can think of, that I know about, that I've heard of, of doing this in a way that, that keeps privacy um, as secure as possible, this is probably the best way. Yeah, because it is it is a hash. It is, it's not scanning a a, a, a photo and saying we think this might be uh, objectionable, illegal content. Let's upload it and check. It's saying here is a list of hashes we know is problematic, and if we see enough of them on this device, we will flag it. We they will say by the way, then we may flag right. it. They say now it's a, the threshold is thirty, roughly thirty images. Yeah, which gets around that, uh, you know, false positive uh, problem. False, yeah. false, false positives. Yeah, and and somebody, some idiot on on a forum, right. uploading something, and mm -hmm. and it's right. something like that. So I agree. I think this is the best way. And I too, like Kevin, you were saying, like having everything encrypted in the cloud, it's that is incredibly important, and it's the reason why I trust Apple with all of my, you know, you know, with all of my. It's stuff, not though because I trust it more than the other. It is not yet. And I think this is the first. I, I'm surprised Apple didn't announce end-to-end -end encryption at the same time. There's maybe political reasons yeah. that they didn't. But mm. they go. That seems to me they go hand in hand. Oh, look! Now we can have end-to-end -end encryption on iCloud because we're scanning on the way in. I, I just see. I don't see this as such a. I mean, this is a database of known offensive child pornography. Like I could, I could go and, in theory, take my iPhone mm. when this is enabled, and I could take 500 pictures of my wife. And I, this is a horrible example, but you know what I'm saying. It yes. could be anything that's personal <laughs> to you. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm not going to do that. But it could be anything. No, that's of me on the would, John. Would, something. Right. right? Uh, in, it would, it in would the hot never tub. Be, yeah. It would never be flagged. It would never be flagged because it's not a no. known offensive image that is child mm -hmm. pornography. So I, I don't know. I'm. I'm fine with it. Yeah. All right. I. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to bring up that whole subject again, but I. I it's. I like to get the varying points of view because it's. It's, it's going to be a conversation that's going to be going on for some time. We'll take a little break, come back with lots more. Kevin Rose is here. His new podcast, Modern Finance, at, very cleverly, modern.finance. Uh, and it's a, it's a good listen. I, it's the only thing that's explained NFTs to me satisfactorily or crypto or any of that stuff. Thank you for doing that, Kevin. And it looks like you're having fun doing it, I must say. Oh, I'm loving it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. It's a fun space. It's oh, rapidly evolving. Oh, it's very evolving. exciting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lisa Schmeiser is also here. She is in the fun space of senior editor at IT Pro today. Mm -hmm. At least fun for you. I I don't know, but <laughs> Leo, I've, I've made this argument before. The fun thing about reporting on IT and IT infrastructure is you sort of get the the first draft of how work and the economy are changing because yeah. the tools that people use are changing. No, that's true. That's that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Nate Langson, he covers technology. 
at Bloomberg. He's their tech editor. He also hosts his own podcast, UKTechShow.com. And that's very true. I bet you you're so sick of talking about Apple C, Sam, you, you could just. Well, actually, to be honest, we talk about it quite very little because it's currently only applicable to the US. US so yeah, yeah. for us, we've we've not got into it in, in, a, in a great in a great detail. I just I look at it from afar and think, well, it's the yeah, it, not to resurrect the conversation, but it's it's the best way of doing it now. But I totally get why a lot of people are nervous about what it could lead to. But right now, it's it doesn't affect anyone outside the US. Text message at UK Tech Show. Dot com. Our show today brought to you by Worldwide Technology and Dell Technologies. WWT is the place to go if you are ready to upgrade your infrastructure. If you're an enterprise, you want to improve security, you're looking at multi-home cloud architectures, uh, DevOps or Agile, they're at the forefront of innovation. But what I love about WWT is that they know business. So Everything they recommend, every system they install, everything that they do for you, they do while looking at your business strategy, your business goals. There's no point in adopting technology if it doesn't support what you're all about. And WWT is great at doing that, working with clients all over the world to transform their businesses. It all starts with the Advanced Technology Center. This is an amazing research and testing lab. WWT started building about a decade ago. It's now got more than half a billion dollars in equipment from all the leading OEMs and the little uh, fast-moving disruptors as well. And what's beautiful about the ATC, you know, the engineers at WWT use it to spin up proofs of concepts and pilots. They can test integration. They can make sure that the customer's existing infrastructure will support their new changes, that kind of thing. They help their customers confidently select the best solutions. It's great for them. It cuts their valuation time from months to weeks. But now, this started last summer, the ATC also offers hundreds of on-demand and schedulable labs to you. You don't even have to go to St. Louis. It's virtualized. So if you're a member of the ATC platform, you can access everything the labs have to offer anywhere in the world 365 days a year. Things like Dell's VX Rail or Cyber Recover Solutions, Power Store, Unity, Power Max, Data Protection Central, and uh, IDPA. These are the newest and latest advances in primary storage. And you can literally try them out ahead of time. You can learn about them. The labs don't just have these you know, uh, hands-on labs, there, there's ATC has technical articles, expert insights, demonstration videos, white papers, all the tools you need to stay up with the latest technology. And not just in primary storage, the other labs in the ATC represent the newest advances in multi-cloud architecture and security and networking, primary and secondary storage, data analytics, AI, DevOps, so much more. When we were out at the labs uh, last year, Lisa and I, we took a tour of the ATC. It was so cool. And uh, they have, I said, what's that uh, cage over in the corner with one little wire coming off of it? <laughs> they said, that's our malware research center. That is, that is physically <laughs> separated from the rest of the lab because that's where we study security and ransomware and things like that. It's really, really neat. And I want you to get access to it. And good news, it's free. You can, you can join the ATC platform and uh, learn more about WWT, gain access to all their free resources by going to WWT.com slash twit. And more than just the ATC platform, check out WWT's events and communities. There's lots of places to learn about technology trends, to hear about the latest research and insights from their experts, to compare notes with other CEOs, CTOs, CISOs, really kind of get a sense of what's going on in the world. You need this in your business, and WWT's got it. Whatever your business needs, they can deliver scalable, tried and tested, tailored solutions just for you. WWT brings strategy and execution together to make a new world happen. To learn more about the ATC, worldwide technology, to gain access to all the free resources, again, wwt.com slash twit. Create that free account on the ATC platform. And do me a favor, please. Uh, use that URL, www.com slash twit, so they know you uh, heard about it here on www.com slash twit on the Twit Podcast Network. Wow, Dark Tipper, This who would have ever thought this? Cloudflare says it mitigated the largest 
DDoS attack ever, 17.2 million requests per second. Ha unbelievable. Hammering a customer in the financial sector. Uh, I'm reading the article from uh, the record.media, uh, Caitlin uh, Chimpano. Uh, Caitlin, or Catal Catalan, I think, says uh, from this tweet, from BitMEX, they think it might have been BitMEX. BitMEX tweeted uh, on August 22nd, that's I guess this morning, we are currently under DDoS and are working to mitigate. Requests reach 7 million a minute at our edge and declining. Cloudflare say, says the attack peaked at 17.2 million HTTP requests a second. Uh, this is um, a, a volume, what they call a volumetric DDoS. Um, they're they're actually, instead of jamming the bandwidth, they're trying to bring down the servers by sending junk HTTP requests to the victim's server and RAM. Um, oh, and by the way, how do they do it? A botnet, 20,000 devices infected with a Mirai, modified version of Mirai, which has been around for a couple of years. Now, that's the IoT malware, the router malware, the FBI was telling everybody, reboot your router. <laughs> you might have Mirai on it. Uh, I guess we didn't eliminate Mirai. Um, it was found in 2016. And it attacks a variety of IoT devices, including cameras. But I think it's routers, really, that are the most useful for these kinds of attacks. They just basically get on your router and start sending out HTTP requests. Uh, you know, they're on the bot. They're on a uh, IRC channel, a botnet channel. Seventeen point two million requests per second. That's two point three terabytes. Oh no, I'm sorry. That's another one. That's a different one. Per se. That's a more traditional DDoS attack. Anything to say about that, Kevin? <laughs> Except wow. I mean, I just love Cloudflare. They're great. Aren't they great? Uh, it's, it's so God, awesome. I love them. They, they protect so many sites on the internet from this kind of stuff. I don't, yeah, normally a uh, company like Cloudflare uh, or, you know, there are lots of companies that offer this kind of mitigation, just throw bandwidth at the problem. But that wouldn't have solved this. In fact, it would have made it worse to throw more bandwidth at it because the attacks are going to the server and trying to bring down the server. So I guess you have to throw hardware at it. I don't know how you mitigate this. It's past my pay grade. <laughs> I'll never, I tell the story all the time about when you were starting Dig, how excited you were when you got a new server to put in the colo and you had to go over to the colo and install the server and put the Yeah, back in my day, back hard, in the day, rack your own hardware. Before there was Cloudflare, before there was VPSs or any of this stuff. Cloud nothing. Yeah, there's cloud no cloud. nothing. <laughs> uh, do you miss those dig days? Uh, it was, it's a ton of fun. I don't miss them. They were insanely stressful. I, I think I anytime you have to manage that many community people coming together to fight about articles and comments and <sighs> spam and all of that stuff, I'm just like, let Reddit have all of that problem. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't want to deal with it. Yeah. It was a lot. You know, I'll tell you, you don't want to run a business these days. Um, it's with between the pandemic and, and, you know, it's just really become a, for instance, Wall Street Journal had a story this week saying if this pand if companies are starting to send people back home, Apple said, no, you know, we thought people were going to come back next month. It's going to be next year. Sometime CEOs are now worried that if this goes on too long, they'll never get employees back in the office. It's crazy. I, I, you know what? It's funny. Well, it's not funny, but during the, the pandemic, I didn't really know that many people that actually got COVID. A few, but not a ton. I know a ton that have it now. Delta is full, bad. They're fully vaccinated. Yeah. You know, the, and they're sick. I, they're not hospital sick, but they, they got hit pretty hard. Yep. Uh, my son got his first shot. Henry is a partier, I guess. And then it was the alpha variant. Some kids came out from Michigan and he got, after his first shot, one week later, or maybe it was one week before his second shot, he got, uh, he got the alpha variant. But that apparently is not even going to help him against uh, the delta variant. So, uh, Apple is uh, saying probably January at least, but I think it's going to be uh, maybe even longer. They don't currently plan to close stores, although they've stepped up testing in Apple retail to twice a week. Uh, they're not requiring uh, vaccines, which is a little surprising to me. Um, maybe a company that's that big 
feels like they can't tell everybody to get a vaccine. They're strongly encouraging vaccination, but you can, as an option, get tested mm. twice a week instead. Well, IBM just closed its New York offices, yeah. New York City offices, yeah. for the same reason. Yeah. Um, amid the, amid the COVID case rising. Apple so. um, closed its uh, retail store uh, this week in South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. Twenty employees either tested positive for or were exposed to COVID nineteen. They also are reducing operating hours at some locations, partly because employees are missing work because of the virus. But also, I think a lot of companies are having a hard time finding employees. This is, a, to me, this is one of the most fascinating things about the pandemic, is how it accelerated some changes, like streaming video, um, you know, uh, DoorDash. Uh, and, then, and then it changed, it's changing the workplace. I suspect that, do you cover this at all in IT Pro? Do you, uh, oh, oh, yes. We've been, we've been covering this since uh, California stay-at-home order in March 2020. I think, uh, you know, we have employees who don't want to come back. Well, there's been a phenomenal growth in cloud-based services precisely for this reason. Right. Uh, you know, since you do have IT pros who, instead of being able to just go to somebody's desk and ask them to turn the machine on and off, <laughs> um, they're put in the challenging position of having to do a lot of remote troubleshooting and business is still going on as usual. So it's made sense to accelerate a migration to all sorts of uh, services in the cloud from platform as a service to desktop as a service to, you know, line of business applications and things like that. Um, just because it's allowed for some semblance of business continuity, it's helped out overworked IT support people. And um, it's, in some cases, even help keep costs down or onboard new people more gracefully. So, so what's going on in the UK, Nate? Are are companies going back to work? Are people uh, reopening and, and returning to normal? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so I I tend to go into our office a couple of days a week um, at the moment at Bloomberg. I mean, we've got a big a big office in in London. There's like sort of three or four thousand of us. Um, wow. at, at, at the Bloomberg office in London. Yeah, it's it's the That's biggest amazing. outside of. Um, outside of New York. And so, you know, we have on-site testing um, and, and and so on. And and I was in there the other day, uh, well, Thursday, Friday, this this week just gone by. And when you walk around outside, it's kind of like there's no pandemic happening. Everything's open, streets are full, everything's just as... It feels like it used to be pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. However, numbers are going up and companies seem to be sitting on the fence like they hadn't a lot of companies hadn't ordered their employees back but we were hearing rumors that a lot were strongly encouraging it and i think at the moment it's more like let's just see how this goes you know um we're not being told to come back um we know that the expect or the hope was that but from september people would maybe be in sort of three days a week um but there's been no update on that and I don't think the pressure is going to be there to be back in the office anytime soon. It's interesting that the journal thinks that it's going to be hard to get people to come back. We have had uh, one employee has decided not to come back of ours, uh, doesn't mm. want to work. She, you know, it's like, well, because we reopened the office, then the mask mandate came back. So now people are wearing masks. But we, mm. one of our employees say uh, they, they don't, I don't want to work in the office. I liked working at home. And I, you know, maybe we're making a mistake, but I think we want people to come back into the office. We kind of like having everybody, you know, we used to, we had, we would have Wednesday lunch. Everybody comes and we have lunch. We did it twice and now we can't do it anymore. <laughs> so, so Lee, you know, there was a really great period. There was a really great piece in the Atlantic this past week talking about, um, they called it the remote work slash fertility connection. <laughs> um, well, it's a little That's and, scary. And, yeah, Wait a minute. No, it's I don't a little know. bit yeah. clickbaity, but the premise of the piece was that people who work remotely often have a lot more flexibility and control over their time than people who go into an office do. And when you have more control over your time, you will make different family planning choices than you would if you have the kind sure. of job where you're, where you're either your hours are unpredictable or your commute is grueling or what have you. 
And I would not be surprised if a lot of the resistance that that some workers are having to going back into the office to do the same work they can do at home while they can also get laundry going and meal prep per week and things like that, a lot of it is them saying, what is this going to add to my quality of life if I have to (laughs) stay away from this house and I have a commute and things like that? And I would be interested to see how many employers start trying to draw a line or, or, or trying to make the pitch that um, in order to keep talent, they'd have to say, okay, you're not going to take a significant quality of life hit if you come back because you'll still have these great quality of life things happening in the office. I mean, I'm not saying all employers will do that, far from it, but I think that this is something employ, employers have to reckon with is you have a lot of people who are like, Sure, homeschooling my kids was a nightmare, but I kind of like being able to work late at night once they go to bed, or I like being able to, you know, eat a good eat, eat a good lunch every day instead of some is, <laughs> some terrible uh, is, deli sandwich. Is the know? notion of all coming to work in an office really kind of a industrial age? A uh, mistake, a dystopia, kind of where everybody's sitting in rows upon rows of desks, kind of like at a out of a sci-fi movie, uh, you know, at their adding machines. I don't, I don't, I don't, I've I don't worked at home so. remotely. I've worked at home remotely for years, but I have to be honest. I love going to tech shows precisely because, like, I'm in a newsroom with a lot I of feel other like people we from other publications. I love too. that buzzy energy, yeah. and I love the productivity. We kind of want it both ways, stretched. don't we? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think workers maybe just want a little bit more control over how they do their work and right. how they deliver it, and it would not. Damn hurt workers! To, Man, you know, yeah. I swear, I tell you, <laughs> it's almost like it's almost like they think uh, tra- tra- training expertise and time for wages gives them a say. Oh, how dare they, <laughs> Nate? What were you going to say? I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, I don't know. I don't think it was as interesting as what Lisa was saying. So um, <laughs> I've, I've I've already forgotten it. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh no! I remember what it was. I remember what it was. Yeah. I, I was going to say, you know, every everyone's circumstance is different. You know, I, I, we don't have kids. I'm the loud one in this house. My wife's the one who has to deal with me. You're the baby. Yeah, yeah. Children. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm a lot older than I'm older than her. Yeah. But I'm the I'm the loud one. Um, but what I was going to say is that you know most of my work and hobbies while I during the pandemic has been in this 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 studio, this office, Um, you know, it's basically work is this way and then fun is that way. And I don't know if you can tell, I mean, you can't really tell because it's half past midnight nearly here, but this window is blocked up. So when my door is shut and I'm in here, there's basically no discernible difference between day and night. There's no natural light. And I was working in here a lot. And then I was turning around and having a lot of fun behind me. And it really took its toll. Like mental health wise, I, I didn't pay enough attention to the lack of diversity and just how I was spending my day, even though I was keeping track of hours and, you know, switching off at the right times, just the very fact of not moving around and interacting with with different environments, it took its toll. And so going back to the office has made a massive difference for me just in terms of breaking up the day, breaking up the week, partly reminding me that I'm still a professional journalist and I'm not just a, you know, a guy at home who pretends to, you know, write about business and finance all day uh, but is actually just playing at it like that has been a (laughs) it's been a noticeable uh, benefit for me everybody is different I could never you know I would never say this is going to be the same for people who have kids or who uh, are dealing with various other lifestyle situations but Mm -hmm. for me the main benefit has been from a mental health standpoint Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know how much that's been talked about in terms of a reason to go back to an office but for me it's been a big reason to to keep going back. The chat room says you have a mullet office. It's it's business and front party in the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, oh, here. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is, for, yeah not your yeah, hair, this. your office. They, <laughs> for people who aren't watching the video, Nate has quite an elaborate drum kit behind him. Uh, and, you know, I think there, there's a good argument that if you uh, do have to work, you should have something you can bang on every once in a while just to get the frustrations out. That seems oh, like. trust me, yeah. When you get when you get scooped at 11 p.m. at night, nothing's better than playing <laughs> <Carol> <laughs> corpse on the drums. Uh, Kevin, do you see people ever, or do you ever leave? That? Do you leave the house? Do you have an office to go to? 
I do, I just work from home. You know, yeah. we do mm-hmm. at, at True Ventures, we do get together and we try to do these like quarterly offsites. And so for us, it's just, you know, getting rapid tested 24 hours before and then all getting together in the same space and doing our thing. And, and then just everyone going back to their house for the next few months. You so always that, struck me as not an introvert, but as a fairly social, you like people. Is it hard for you and Daria to, to be at home and just. I like, I like the computer better. <laughs> to yeah. Be honest. Like, yeah, me too. I, I have no problem just being on yeah. a computer and just geeking mm-hmm. out over something. So it doesn't. You know, it is it is tough though because we, here in Portland, you know, we get um, during the winter time just nonstop rain, and combine that with like not seeing humans, it's just like you have to do something. You have to plan a trip somewhere else. You know, dear diary, another day of rain. No I know humans. a lot of folks in the Pacific Northwest who go to Hawaii in the middle of the winter. Yeah, yeah get some exactly. Sunshine. We yeah. we do Cabo, and that's yeah, that sounds awesome. nice. Yeah. 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 And Lisa, you go into an office, right? Uh, no, we actually began working remotely full time yeah. in, I want to say 2018. See, this and is the irony of it. Every single person who's on this podcast and on our podcast <laughs> network, yeah. we're all, in, we're all hate people. Well, they turned my, <laughs> they turned, they, they turned my office into a hoteling situation where yeah, the that's awful. only folks, who, well, the only folks who had consistent desks were the sales team. I don't like team. that at all. And, um, with, with the hoteling situation, if it was a, th- I was like, why am I going to the effort of commuting when I can just yeah. have a workspace that works for me? I can work the hours that my East Coast team needs me to work. Right. And I can still meet people in the city and still meet vendors and have interviews and things like that. So um, I do miss some of the collegiality of being in a newsroom with other people. It's, we've done a good job creating a great team culture where I work, where we're checking in with each other a lot. There's socialization, there's team building, there's really good communication across time zones and across multiple vectors, blah, blah, blah. But there's just something really nice about being able to, to, to shout to an editor like two or three desks over about something and have a quick collab. And I miss that. I can see why there are people who make an argument that you need to be in a specific workspace with colleagues to get stuff done. Um, I talk about but this with people like Paul Thorat, and he says, "I've been, <laughs> I've been quarantined since 1995. I don't, I don't ever yeah. leave the house." I mean, my company recently reconfigured its San Francisco office, so it's not even smaller, and they're taking away a lot of the banks of desks that they used to have and doing more meeting rooms and more social spaces. And the conception now is that if you are in an office, you're not there to sit at a desk and work. You're there to do really project specific or event specific collaboration. Um, So I I thought it was interesting that we were heading towards that. And I do think there may be some other industries that are, that, that have a business model or circumstances that are flexible enough to do that. I don't think it's going to like permeate like workplaces around the world and around different industries. Like you're never going to have a hospital where they're like, you know what? We think all the Stay phlebotomists home. can do their jobs remotely. Stay home. No. It's like Stay home. <laughs> yeah. Although I have to say, I, you could even think about reinventing this. You know, I recently had a relative mm-hmm. who passed away in the hospital. Would have been so much better had he had hospice at home and passed mm-hmm. away with his family and friends at home because of COVID protocols, he couldn't be, people couldn't say goodbye. It was just terrible. I'm so sorry. Lady. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, it, it was on Lisa's side, so I didn't know him, but, yeah. uh, it, it, but I could watch this play out. And, um, I think there's a lot to be said for not dying in a hospital. I told Lisa, mm-hmm. I said, just in case you're interested, if, when I get really sick, put me a hammock, by the ocean in Hawaii, I'll expire there. That's fine. Uh, I don't. I don't want to die in a hospital, even if it meant mm-hmm. living three weeks longer. What's the point if you're, you know, in a hospital bed? It's not. That's not what I want. So yeah, I agree. I actually during the pandemic, I attended my first ever um, virtual live streamed funeral, which was a mm-hmm. very surreal experience. From, I was actually at the office, and I was, you know, streaming it. Um, from the, uh, the the funeral home, and it was kind of like a you know they have a camera right at the back looking down, and um, it's a very it was a very surreal experience to to watch a funeral remotely live you know with relatives and I can see the back of their heads. Was it so less very, satisfying, or I mean, do you want to hug these people and? You know what, 
I, I, it was weird, but I quite liked it yeah. because See, this I is why. physically couldn't be there. Like I couldn't be there. So it was either do that. Yeah, or you, at nothing. least you got to do that. You wouldn't have been there anyway. So at least you got to do that. And the people who were there knew that my brother and I were watching remotely. Yeah. Um, Good. So, so that was yeah. There. That was yeah. It was it was it was something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just it, it, this is just yet another way the world is changing. Um, another way the world is changing. Poor Scarlett Johansson's only going to get twenty million dollars for Black Widow, and she's not happy about that. We are now uh, finding out how much Black Widow. Made Disney made an interesting uh, choice, as did, by the way, Warner Media with their movies. They decided uh, to release to streaming to their own Disney Plus network the same day that they released to theaters. And uh, we've mentioned this before. Scarlett Johansson said, "But my deal involved a percentage of the box office, and so you've put me at a disadvantage." Now we're seeing in Discovery that Disney's got $125 million in online revenue from Black Widow, none of which uh, Johansson will get. Uh, Although the company says, even (laughs) we're going to be so nice, even though we don't have to, we're going to give you a percentage from the the online revenue. Disney said the actress had already been paid $20 million for her work on the film, but we will agree to include online revenue in the calculation for bonuses, even though we're not obligated to do so. <laughs> uh, you know, my gut reaction when I read this, right, was I think like most people, which is, oh, let me find my tiny little violin and <laughs> play you a song. There is a part of me, though, that thinks if you agreed something ahead of time and it's written in a contract and that's what you went into it expecting and then it doesn't happen you're kind of in your right to be annoyed and it's you know it's it's a huge amount of money and it's you know it's for almost they said it might be as much as 50 or 60 million dollars that she's lost out on I, yeah. she's still going to eat and have a very nice time and buy a new phone and a car like whatever i get that but at the end of the day if you're promised something and you sign something and then someone the changes contract. the rules and yeah. says I kind of think fair enough to be annoyed, at least. I understand. Look, Disney's saying, well, we, we would have loved to have a theatrical release and we would have loved okay. to share those revenues. We couldn't. Well, actually, they did, but we're not going to, we know we're not going to make as much money on the theatrical release. It is a little bit the case that they, yeah. they're going to benefit with new subscribers to Disney Plus, right? If they make Disney Yeah, but it wasn't even it wasn't even that Disney Plus didn't offer for free. You had to pay for the movie. No. Yeah, 30 you bucks. You had to pay $30. Plus. Yeah. 30 yeah. bucks. It's- you do get to watch the movie more than once for like more than well, 24 to 48 hours. So, because how many days do you have to watch it if you pay for it? You know, I want to say it's at least two weeks. And the oh, only reason I'm com- okay. and the only reason I'm comfortable saying that is because when um, Raya and the Last Dragon came out, um, a friend did the $30 uh, download slash purchase for her kid. And Two weeks later, she's like, "We're still watching the movie." Oh. She's like, "I've amortized the cost of this movie several times." Honestly, <laughs> I doubt I'd want to watch Black Widow more than twice, but okay, yeah. you know. The thing that I find I would love to find out how her contract and her deal for her solo movie stood up against um, anything, any deals that say Robert Downey Jr. or Chris Hemsworth or Chris Evans would have struck. Um. And mind you, they all have the advantage of having solo outings, multiple solo outings before a pandemic. But I'd love to see what sort of deal her agent was able to get compared to the deals that these guys pulled, the, the other Avengers who, who have solo movies were able to pull in. Oh, you know what? You're right. As long as you retain your subscription to Disney+, Plus, you've basically bought Black Widow for as long as you're on Disney+. Plus. Now, it will be free in a f- couple of months, so... Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. you know, it's, until it's not. I mean, honestly, that's what I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah, me too. I didn't have that. Jungle Cruise going to have the same thing starting July 30th. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be on Disney Plus at the same time as they release it in the theaters. I'm not all that anxious to go to a theater. So uh, on the one hand, I think Disney's, I, and it's understandable why Disney and Warner didn't put these movies o- mm-hmm. exclusively in theaters. But they did have a deal. I mean, I don't know. The deal said uh, you'll get a percentage of the box office. Mm-hmm. It didn't say. I just don't see why you don't pay her. Like, yeah, I just you give want her, her to money. make another movie yeah. for you, and yeah. she's amazing. She's right. the centerpiece yeah. of the movie. It's not like she's like some, you know, this well, is it, about her. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's expensive because she can be. So, right. so I, I wonder if that was, I wonder if that was part of it too, but it's not a good look for Disney because um, it's, not. it's it's not a good look for multiple reasons, but uh, among them is like, it took forever to give Scarlett Johansson her solo movie to begin with. And it doesn't help the perception that Marvel was not particularly interested in cultivating a Marvel fan base beyond like comic book dudes. Um, and so when you have a lawsuit where you're like, oh, it took forever for the female adventure to get her solo movie. And, and now they're going to cheat her. Yeah. And they're going to cheat her. And chances are good that the, the they don't cheat for or Downey. Jr. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's just bad PR. So for them yeah. to be able to say, OK, fine, we'll pay you um, our bad. Like this is a little bit of damage control, I think. Yeah. Uh, let's take a little break. Uh, and then it's Elon's robot when we continue. <laughs> Uh, Nate Langston is here, technology editor for uh, the Bloomberg. He's based in the UK and, of course, has his uh, own podcast uh, at UT UKTechShow.com. Lisa Schmeiser, editor at IT Pro Today. Great to have you. God, you know, we were so close to having people back in the studio. I was looking forward to Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> <sighs> Nothing. Man, those Samoas would have tasted good right about now. And Kevin Rose, the Dark Tipper from Tech TV's Dark Tipper, he also. I'm more of a Thin Mints fan. Actually, <laughs> oh yeah, those are good too. You're kind of an old old you gotta school. Got to put them in the. You got to put them in the freezer. You're an old school guy. Oh, tasty, uh, tasty. He's, he's not wrong. He's actually, not wrong. Frozen Girl Scout cookies. Are great. When we're going to come back, we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about how how the Girl Scouts are modernizing. It's very interesting, yeah. uh, in a little bit. Kevin's got a podcast called Modern Finance. I highly recommend. If you want to know how you can take an icon, a little mini icon of a zombie and make millions, you got to listen. you got to listen to Modern Finance at modern.finance. It's great to have all three of you. Our show today brought to you by Wealthfront. Now, this kind of speaks to me uh, maybe a little bit more than cryptocurrency and NFTs. I am a big fan. Somebody told me uh, when I was in my 30s, you know, Leo, take advantage of that 401k put a little bit away on a regular basis because that nest egg grows thanks to the magic of compound interest. And by the time you're an old man, you're going to have a lot more. you got to start young. And I tell my kids the same thing. The You can talk about stonk memes and rocket ships and diamond hands and NFTs all you want. Day trading, sure, I'm sure it's fun. <laughs> but if you want to grow your long-term wealth and still make it to the moon... Can I recommend a Wealthfront investment account today? It, it, this, is, this is not some brilliant insight on my part. Decades of data show that investors that trade individual stocks underperform the market every year. It's hard to beat the market to time your purchase and sale of an individual stock. Only 1% of day traders beat the market. Your chance is 1 in 100. I know you're smarter than all the other guys. Well, trust me, the odds are not in your favor if you're going it alone. Maybe, you know what, do what Lisa does, which is have a little bit of a fun account that you do those individual stocks with, but you really want to build long-term wealth, save up for retirement, for college, for your kids, for that house, that first house, team up with Wealthfront instead. It really simplifies it. I know investing can be complicated, but even if you've been investing for years, just look at what Wealthfront does, and I think you'll see it's the right way to do it. Wealthfront makes it easy. No matter what your goals are, in fact, that's the very first question they're going to ask you. Your time frame, your, how, how, how comfortable you are with risk. You don't have to be, by the way. They have got the right tools for every portfolio. They will create for you a portfolio of globally diversified, low-cost index funds personalized for you in minutes. No manual trades. You don't have to pick stocks. And what you really can, do, can stop doing is watching the stock market every day. They handle all the investing based on your preferences. That's what you control. You say what your goals are. They do things that are hard to do on your own, things like tax loss harvesting. Uh, lowers the taxes you pay as you invest and I'm telling you, all this stuff adds up over the years. The a, a fee for this, very low, 0.25%. In fact, so low that tax loss harvesting, in, in many cases, will just cover that advisory fee. And all of that happens automatically. Wealthfront's done so well now. They have $20 billion in assets. And we've got a great deal for you. You can get your first $5,000 managed for free 
Just go to wealthfront.com slash twit. Easy to open an account. All you need is $500 to get started. It's like planting a tree. You know, the best time to plant a tree is today. <laughs> uh, even, even if you're my age, get started. Grow the wealth that you'll need the easy way. Let Wealthfront do the work for you. And, and what a great deal to get your first $5,000 managed free for life. That's fantastic. Go to wealthfront.com slash twit. Wealthfront.com slash twit. W-E-A-L-T-H-F-R-O-N-T. Wealthfront.com slash twit. Start growing your savings. Now's the time. Go to wealthfront.com slash twit and get started today. Actually, the you got to say something about Wealthfront real quick. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an angel investor there. Oh, uh, I'm a fan, I'm I have a fan no of idea. Wealthfront. No idea. Yes. Yeah, I know this is not paid or anything, but I've had Andy Ratcliffe, the CEO on my show before. Yes. And I'm, I'm a huge fan, uh, obviously, of what they've created. You know, I when I think about this stuff and we talk about on modern finance, I'm like, okay, you need like the majority of your your assets in something safe like Wealthfront that's fully diversified because that's like going to be the safest place to have it. The other thing though that I'll tell you that is brand new that you don't know this yet, Leo, probably. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't. So uh, this is a great little hack that you can only do with Wealthfront. So you can go inside to Wealthfront. You can go into your IRA or your tax deferred account and you can now choose to have uh, the uh, Bitcoin trust put in there. What? Or, oh, I didn't know that. Ethereum trust. Yeah. So, so Grayscale has the Bitcoin trust or the Ethereum trust. And now you're holding your cryptocurrency in your IRA um, inside of Wealthfront or your 401k. It's, it's so amazing. brilliant. It's so cool. And then when there's competitive other, uh, when they can do the talk, uh, eventually when they can, they can do the uh, tax loss harvesting as well, they'll add that there uh, as on top of it. It's going to be, Really awesome. That's it's it's very like the best way to hold uh, cryptocurrency in a tax deferred account. It's it's really cool. Brilliant. Well, thank you for that additional plug. They didn't even <laughs> know you were going to be here. Wealthfront.com slash twit. Please do, do use that address, though, so they uh, know you saw it uh, on Twitter. Yeah, I've been talking to them a lot about um, how they can incorporate cryptocurrency really related cool. products and stuff in there. And that's a smart really cool. way. That's like a diversified way. That's not, that is, you know, cause that's what they're known for is just really that safety, which is awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's cool. Well, you know, and my daughter wanted to buy Dogecoin and, uh, and I, I, I kind of want to discourage her, but at the same time, oh, it's fun. It's, you know, she's not going to spend a lot of money on it. And then she wanted to do it in Robinhood. And I, I, I had to explain to her, you know, you're not really holding Dogecoin or any coin when you buy it through Robinhood. That's something else they're doing entirely. Um, it's complicated, but I don't, but as far as I could tell, they weren't backing that asset with actual Bitcoin. They were just giving you a, an investment vehicle that matched Bitcoin's return, which they, the, Robinhood does hold, they help, they hold they? their stuff on, 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 yeah. So they, they do have the wallets and they, they actually oh, okay. do hold the crypto there. I was wrong. So they, but they do not give you the private keys and they don't give you the ability to transfer it outside. It's not your That's wallet. what you're thinking. Yes. So it's it's the classic crypto uh, slogan of uh, not your keys, not your crypto. Right. So, you know, and, and you can't transfer it out just like PayPal, which is which is kind of it sucks because like what if you want to like leave? Right. Like and take your crypto elsewhere and you just can't move it out. But they said they're going to be adding that eventually. But I don't know when the time. What's your take is. on Robin Hood? I, or, I guess I should ask you if you, if you have an investment in it. Um, we did invest at Google Ventures, but um, it was a pretty minor investment. But I, I'm fine with saying that I think that uh, it is it. They were the first to. Well, they've got a bunch of problems. There were some issues with front running uh, and some. They were selling some of the data, and there was just when you offer a service for free, you have to make some money. Got to make the money somehow. <laughs> right? yes. Exactly. Yes. So there were other ways and little tactics that they weren't fully disclosing, or at least that they weren't. They were tucking them into certain areas of terms of service and things where, you know, their 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 user base didn't really know what was going on. So I, I think they're going to fix some of that stuff. But I, I'm I don't hold any crypto there. I don't hold any assets there. I think for someone that is wants to do a quick little ten dollar stock trade or a hundred dollars, yeah. and you just don't want to go through the uh, trouble of opening a Schwab account or whatever it may be, like yes, that's going to be the easiest way to do it. Um, although Square Cash App is also really convenient at holding fractional shares of stocks. Um, so I, I do I would like probably that. use Square. I do like that. And I have to say, thanks to Robinhood, you're seeing the whole FinCEN world change. I mean, they established you could have free trades. Now everybody's doing it. So right. uh, there's, they get some credit for putting some pressure on the, on the big guys like Schwab. 
Yeah. And fractional ownership is huge too. Oh, right? I love that you, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Just because some people can't afford an entire share and that's the way it used to be. You'd have to have, you want to buy Google, you had to spend X thousands right. of dollars before or wait for a stock split, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Apple's 148 bucks, you know, you, but, but for a dollar you could buy a fractional share. And I think that that gives you some sense. I like it because it, for people like Abby, she, you know, she's in her twenties. It gives her some sense of participating. And it's and really, that was my attitude was, yeah, go ahead, play with this a little bit. Uh, you, cause you need to learn about it and then you should listen yeah. to modern finance and see what you did wrong. <laughs> Actually, I am mad at Peter Thiel. I wish I, I told Abby, get a Roth IRA while you're poor. <laughs> Peter, t tell me what Peter Thiel did, Kevin. You probably understand this better. The Roth yeah. IRA, you have to have a low income level. I think you have to be under 144,000 a year, but you can put the money in post tax so it's it's dollars you've earned and paid taxes on, but then any income increase, you know, capital gains in the Roth IRA are not taxable on withdrawal. And what apparently smart billionaires have been doing is putting assets that they know are going to appreciate like crazy in these Roth IRAs. Yeah. Teal has billions in a Roth IRA that he'll yeah. never pay taxes on. That's right. Yeah, so you can you can transfer an assets like um, let's just say you found a new company and you have founder shares of that company and you believe it's going to be massive. Like there are ways and vehicles and to transfer in those assets into tax deferred accounts. Now, granted, he can't touch that until retirement age. I guess he's probably close to it now. But um, you know, once once that happens, it's going to be all tax free. He. Uh, but anyone can do that. That's not just a anybody. Weird billionaire no, that's what trick. I told her. I said, now while you're poor. <laughs> <laughs> invest in a company that's going to the moon. <laughs> that's the trick. Teal obviously knew how to do that. He turned $2,000 in a Roth IRA into $5 billion. Hasn't put any more money since 99. Now, I take it that he probably had some years, as sometimes really rich people do, where he had no income, right? So he was able to open a Roth IRA. That's, that's the trick. What yeah. did he put in there? Was it PayPal shares, did it say? Um... Something that he was involved in early on and then yeah. transferred. He, and that's yeah. the thing. You have to know that it's going to be uh, huge. And you, no one knows that. I'm just looking to see what's in there. 17, 1.7 million shares of PayPal. Mm, yeah. Bought them for, get ready for this, in 1999.001 cent a share. In other words, he got 1.7 million shares for $1,700. That's what happens when you're in the founding team. <laughs> And the you, same and, for every tech company. Yeah, and you're a believer in it. Did you have you done that? I have not. I've not transferred anything into God. any tax deferred. But it's, it's a know. backdoor Roth. That's a backdoor I'd like to try out. Hey, before we uh, we're gonna take a little break before we go on and talk about Elon's robot and the, and the Girl Scouts and uh, a whole lot more. Uh, I did want to tell you about some of the things you might have missed this week. We had a fun week. A little mini movie for you. What happened this week on Twit. <laughs> CES 2022 is on, baby. Just Woo! bring your COVID card. Who's going? I'd go. What are your odds? Y'all you going? Think? Could you could editors you could you put some crickets in there right there at that point? <laughs> <laughs> Previously on Twit. Tech News Weekly. In recent weeks about the metaverse, whatever that is. It's called Horizon Workrooms. And it was shown off to journalists this week, but designed for people working together. I can't imagine a worse Hands-on photography. Today on Hands-on Photography, I have another bit of feedback that's quite common. You know, someone wants to know, what are your alternatives to Photoshop? Well, I got a couple things in mind. All about Android. The embargoes lifted for uh, Pixel 5a with 5G. I happen to have it right here. I've had it for the past week. And, uh, it's been my primary phone. Windows Weekly. Amazon just got a different $10 billion cloud contract from the NSA. So this is a contract that's codenamed Wild and Stormy. That's a cocktail name, isn't it? <laughs> that was it the is. Dark and Stormy. Dark oh, and Stormy. <laughs> we think it's a contract about... Uh, involving NSA trying to consolidate all the right. data that it has in multiple repositories into a single that sex on the beach lake. server they've been using. <laughs> exactly. In the fuzzy naval exactly. server, they're going to replace yeah. that right? with Wild and Stormy. Twit. Somewhere there's an agent going to run to a server. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's talk about the Girl Scouts. 
in a bizarre segue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a natural continuum for Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel <laughs> and uh, Roth Iris, uh, yeah. Backdoor Iris, two Girl Scouts. Actually, you said this before the show. I thought it was very interesting. There is now a badge for digital literacy. It's digital leadership. Oh, um, even better. Yes, digital leadership. The Girl Scouts are offering it at uh, all the levels, starting with daisies, who are the really little guys, kindergarten, first grade, all the way up through, I want to say, um, seniors, senior Girl Scouts, which are your high schoolers. And Yeah, as, no, all the way up to ambassador, I think. Oh, ambassadors, who are like your 11th graders and your 12th graders. And the skill set for each of the badges remains the same. It's so just the sophistication cute. for each you know, grows with age, but basically the girls are going to learn how to discover and assess what their digital landscape is, you know, to define what a digital landscape is. They will be learning how to detect misinformation. Uh, they'll be this learning how to design or participate in a, in a constructive digital community. They'll learn about the do's and don'ts of putting content, creating and putting content online, and then they'll share their best practices with, with other people. Kind Look at this. Fantastic. this is, isn't this, this yeah. is for brownies. That's second and third mm -hmm. grainers. Uh, yeah. Discover your digital footprint. The, the, first, explore the differences between public and private information. This is second and third graders. Yeah. So I think this for the is brownie, so I've, great. I've pulled up the curricula now for the, because in my troop, we have brownies, uh, juniors and cadets. So our girls span about a, a, a five grade continuum and starting at brownies, they're going to learn what catfishing is, what oh a digital footprint is, uh, the difference between public versus private information. And then by the time I'm talking with my middle schoolers, they'll also be learning about um, trolling, phishing. Um, wow. Slack division and hashtag activism. <laughs> um, and then there's a whole exercise that you do on how to detect digital misinformation, how to debunk a debate online. And uh, another thing they're talking about in the badges are where to go if you're being harassed or having trouble online, how to reach out and talk to somebody and, and get over the fear that you might be in trouble or that you've done something that can't be undone. So. Look at this, the cadets public print out this, my digital data tracker, where yeah. they actually track which devices they used to go to which platform, what they did, what data or content they shared, with whom did they share it, what was your mood before, and what was your mood after. Yeah. Oh, this is the kind of thing every every kid should, should do, I think. There's a digital wellness routine they're encouraging for the girls where they want them to monitor their screen time and be honest about how much time they're spending. Yeah. They want them to, you know, before you post something, check in with your values. Um, and then check in with your feelings and ask for help if you need it. I'm going to do this. I, I really, well, I, I, I like that they're adding skills that point out that what happens online is going to affect you, period. Like it's a really holistic look. Because I, I think one of the things that people... In, in say my gen, I'm, I'm Gen X, but people like me who came of age using computers, but not necessarily online until we got to school, there's still a tendency to distinguish between online and offline life. And that's simply not a helpful distinction. No. And what I love about these badge programs, you know, looking them over, is that they don't make that distinction. It's basically this is, and the Girl Scouts have always had badges on how to manage other parts of your life, from personal finance to physical fitness to um, civic engagement. And they're just now extending this to this is another area where you're going to have to develop a set of skills that will serve you well in life. I love um, it. Lisa, I have a question for you about the Girl Scouts. Uh -huh. I'm curious. Yeah. You know, I, I was an Eagle Scout on the Boy Scout side. And, and over over the last like decade or so or five or so years, I've just been kind of disgusted with a lot of the stuff that's been happening at the Boy Scout level. Does mm. the, the Girl Scouts have a lot of that the same politics or is it a kind of a, a different organization altogether? So my brother's an Eagle Scout. We were like a total scouting family. I've got my golden girl scouting. He has his Eagle. Um, organizationally, they are very different. Um, I've actually uh, been in trainings where I, I, 
when I got certified in um, wilderness recovery and first aid, I, I was like, why are we so risk averse? Why is there so much certification? And one of the things they said, <laughs> one of the things they said was, we want to make sure that we're reducing risk to the girls at every level. And they have that built into the culture. For example, mm-hmm. if you have a married couple in a troop, you have to have like as leaders in a troop, there always has to be a third unrelated adult there. Um, there are really, really strict rules as to uh, who can shepherd on camping and why this is the case. And they're communicated very clearly. Um, so that was a way of sidestepping some of the liability issues that have dogged the Boy Scouts. As to some of the political and cultural issues, I'm in the Bay Area, so <laughs> it's not going to, it may not be the same always, but I've been involved as an adult leader since 2001. And even as far back as 2001, um, anybody who thinks or identifies as a girl has been welcome in Girl Scouting. Oh, and that's great. That's fantastic. And, and is, so that far, really, is that really uh, honored in spirit as well as by the rule? I, yeah. At that's least it really is great. In, in my service unit and in the council stuff I've seen, that's true. Um, one of my favorite uh, troop leaders in another troop, uh, you know, she and her wife ran a troop successfully for several years. And so there's never really, not there's never, because that's not true, but in my experience as an adult leader for 20 years, we haven't had the cultural flashpoints with quote, what they what they called in Boy Scout or Girls, Girls, Gods, Gays. It hasn't been an issue in Girl Scouting. Yeah. Um, the biggest issue that's actually coming up is because of the Boy Scouts. <laughs> because now that the Boy Scouts is open to women or, or they're open to little girls and you can have little girls go through Boy Scouting and get up to the Eagle Scout level, um, that's something where I've talked to families who were like, well, you know, no offense, but no one's ever heard of the gold award. Everyone knows what an Eagle Scout is. And so there, there is a little bit of um, organize, organizational anxiety around what kind of relationship the Girl Scout organization is going to have with the Boy Scout organization. We don't even call it Boy Scouts anymore. It's Scouts BSA because of that. And Scouts BSA, yeah. 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 Interesting. But, yeah, but, I didn't re- yeah, Nate, Nate to- are, were you anything? Bes- I mean, I got one Eagle Scout. I got one gold. What are we, what, they, you and I. They had girl guides in the UK. I don't know about the boys <laughs> did, you, did you get anything, any honors as a uh, young man? No, uh, I, I, I didn't really want them. I, I was quite disruptive when I was young. So I didn't really uh, want to get involved in that much stuff. I know my mum was a, was a girl guide. Oh, that's nice. Um, I've seen photos and, and things when, when she was a, a, a girl guide. I think we... I may have been in something called Cubs, which is like, I think that's a younger version of Scouts here. I think yeah, it was we have, in that we have that too. Scouts. Cub Scouts is, is before Boy Scouts, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cub Scouts. it goes Tigers, yeah. so, Cubs, we below those Boy Scouts, right? Yeah. yeah. Got it. I think I might have been in that when I was, uh, when I was very young. Um, but yeah, when I was when I was older, it, 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 I was more um, I was more interested in in just playing the drums basically and anything that took a time away from that I yeah. wasn't really that interested in that all my dad, taking computers apart my, my dad was the scout leader so like it was like there you wasn't no a choice, choice for me yeah, yeah I was yeah. like nope you're going to scouts and I'd be like dad yeah. I don't want to wear the uniform girls think it looks dumb I'm, I'm embarrassed and like I was just, yeah. but I, in retrospect you know many years later you look back on it and you're like those were fun camping trips I learned a lot it was like it was time well spent but at the time I did, I, I'd rather be skateboarding yeah, the uniform exactly, is tough. exactly the same. Like especially as you get into middle school and high school. And, oh yeah, um, yeah they're embarrassing. I'll, yeah, and I'll have to <laughs> check this because my my first wave of girls is now is now middle school. When I was a Girl Scout, we were required to have the uniform before we could receive our silver or gold awards. And like when I was a teenager, I wanted nothing less than to oh I had to toe polyester with the trefoils and why. <laughs> I, I really hope it's not the same now. But um. Oh, Leo, you have to Google Kevin Rose Boy Scout. I actually did post my Eagle Scout photo oh, wait a minute. online at this. one point. You got to pull this When we were yeah. doing uh, Tech Google TV, we would get huh. very regularly uh, re- requests to write letters for uh, Eagle Scouts. Oh, my goodness. And uh, I always took it very seriously. Is this... Is this your? Uh, yeah, That's there you me. are. There you are. There's me. Look, Look how at that tiny cute I was. boy. I was like a, a late... This was like an Eagle Scout. I was a late bloomer. 
You got a Look lot of badges. Those badges. badges. Holy I love cannoli. it. That's so it that great. was that was heavy on those shoulders. <laughs> yeah. What what badge did you enjoy the most? Uh, Wilderness Survival was probably my favorite. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Somewhere else. Did you ever go to Philmont? Uh, I did not, unfortunately. Oh. I'm bummed I didn't get a chance to. Yeah. What's yeah. that? Is that the big uh, jamboree? No, it's a a, a campground, um, oh. a camping site it's, out west. It's like it's a, a hike, it's a, right? It's a it's a it's a, it's a quote unquote adventure ranch in the high country in New Mexico, oh. and you can go out there and do rock climbing and backcountry trekking, and it's it's like a really big deal for scouts when they get to go there. Wasn't there a big long hike associated with that? Some big trip they did, or was that just I can't recall. There's also yeah, I know this the, the Boy Scouts also do like a rim to rim Grand Canyon thing too. So it's it's they, they do like the I, I feel like I should run up the flag for the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts do a lot of amazing treks and things like that. Um but Philmont was like a, a holy grail for Boy Scouts when my brother was in it. You know, yeah. it was, oh the Philmont trip. So so sad. I will say when I was looking at these digital um, leadership badges, um, I was perhaps unfairly assessing them with a gimlet eye because they were underwritten with a grant from Instagram. And so oh. part of me was like, is posting on Instagram going to be a requirement here or, or ah, something that's like that? not so bad. I mean, no, it looks like if there's if there's anything, it's a light touch. But I, I do appreciate that they're teaching the girls how to identify clickbait and um how to look, how to look for, how to assess digital bias and things like that. Cause I mean, digital literacy is a huge concern uh, for, for people who are growing up online. And, and this is, it's, it's anything that helps people get a, a set of skills will be a good th- to yeah. the good, I think. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. I was trying to find my, uh, my Cub Scout picture if I, but I don't think I can find it. So I'd yeah. love to see that. I was, I was in yeah. Cub Scouts. I didn't make it to Boy Scouts. Uh, that's that's a lot better than the picture that I sent to uh, be- my, my best friend the other day, which is the time that I um, uh, was dressed in a tutu with uh, <laughs> Christmas, no judgment Christmas tree, Christmas tree. Yeah, well, th- there were extenuating circumstances, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, that's that was an interesting photo to discover. Definitely get Apple Apple flagged for sure on that one. <laughs> oh yeah, there was. Yeah, it was uh, it was a fun evening from what I remember of it. But I was like <laughs> that 19. That phrase covers a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, I really was hoping I could find my uh, my Cub Scout picture, but I I know it's somewhere. I'll find it. I'll dredge it up. I'm ho- I'm doing this. I'm holding up my hand. Probably I guess it's supposed to be the right hand. Um, mm-hmm. Elon Musk has announced that within a year. Tesla will have a humanoid robot that can do all the boring stuff. He says, we know everything there is to know about how to do this. Uh, and, uh, and you know, in our research for self-driving vehicles and so forth, uh, he probably maybe messed uh, up the announcement a little bit. Uh, this is, let me refresh this page so you can see mm-hmm. the robot Just marching. Just wait for them to do the Charleston. Just wait the for them to the do the Charleston. Yeah. It wasn't a robot, though. It's it was very, like a human in a, in and a then robot. Uh, it starts dancing. So it That's wasn't, a it wasn't in, in a fact a robot. Suit. Yeah. It was a dancer in a spandex suit. <sighs> That's a horrible announcement. Some people yeah. say it might have had something to do with the fact that the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration announced they were investigating Tesla's self-driving features after driving to a number of emergency vehicles. Um, and te- Elon was just trying to distract. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that is that is a reaction gif just <laughs> waiting <laughs> to happen. Well, he, he talks about how it's going to, quote, unquote, eliminate dangerous, repetitive, boring tasks. And I just want to know, has he taken a look at what robotics is already doing? <laughs> like, it's, uh, does he real like, does he oh, actually yeah. know fact, what I've the big been, challenges are right now I've in robotics the, process the, automation or the anything The floor like that? of the Tesla pant in the Fremont, yeah. where they have massive German robots that pick up yeah. the cars, flip them over, move them down the line. I mean, they use... Uh, as many robots as they can in the production line uh, of Teslas, yeah. so he understands. And how many? And how many robots. of them need? How many of them need stage perfect jazz hands? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Tesla bot says Elon will stand five feet eight inches tall, weigh 125 pounds, 
56 kilograms, uh, have human level hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he says we can do it in about a year. Uh, a number of people have also pointed out that it's taken Boston dynamics to do a 10 years to do Atlas. Mm -hmm. Uh, although Atlas can dance too. Let's, let's not forget Atlas is a uh, pretty, pretty. Well, what are these dangerous, repetitive, boring tasks that he thinks he's going to somehow, uh, turn over to the province of the of the jazz hands robot. Well, I wonder if maybe he's thinking about Amazon um, warehouses, things like that. You don't need to have an anthropomorphic robot to, to stock or restock, you know? It's no, they have pick and like picker that. machines that do it. Uh, exactly. But, but yeah. uh, on the other hand, uh, because the environment is designed for humanoids in many respects, there are reasons mm -hmm. to have humanoid robots. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, just I mean, bilateral symmetry is nice to look at, but let's not make let's not assume it's the most efficient use of space or task Elon, management. Elon's a, f a funny fella. That's all I can yeah. say. Um, let's see. Anything else? Did I miss any of the big stories we wanted to talk about? I think we got them all in here. We've kept you long enough. <laughs> I do thank all of you. I think it's hysterical that China has passed a new data privacy law. But uh, maybe we'll save that for another conversation another day. Nate Langson is up late. It's, it's pushing one one a.m. in uh, in. Sure are you in? Are you in? Where in England are you? I always ask you this. I, I'm 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 just north of London. I say London, and it is technically the outskirts of London in Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire. Um, I just wanted to yeah. you to say Hertfordshire. I, I live in I live in Hertfordshire. It's true. Is I live in in. Like a nature reserve oh, in Hertfordshire. How nice! Not a cute little town, but actually in the country. Yeah, nice. as close to as close as to the country as you can get when you work in the financial district of London. Oh, oh you go into the yeah. city every, but not every day. Every every. Few no, days. at the moment a couple cu couple of days a week, nice. but um, yeah. So it's it's sort of nature all around, and then go into the chaos of the city when when needed. Sometime we're going to get you. To end this show with a drum solo, I'm just warning you. I would love to One see. Day. I would love to see the party in the back. That's all I'm saying. Well, you can see it. I, I I use my Instagram these days almost exclusively for drum stuff. So if anyone wanted to see some of that or hear it, it's on my Instagram. Nate likes some drums. Um, <laughs> it's like Twitter. I keep for professional Bloomberg related stuff, and uh, Instagram is just a purely drums and drumming stuff and here comes so see it there. the drums ladies and gentlemen look at that yeah he's, he's banging the skins yeah so my new 14 inch sure. roland v drums yeah there's a, there's a oh the robots are still i was gonna say it sounds like robots let me turn the robots off so we can hear <laughs> that's that did sound like robots this is nate on the drums much better. I can play this without fear of takedown. I like it. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. That's all right. <laughs> no takedowns. Thank you also, Lisa Schmeiser, uh, uh, Windows, I'm sorry, IT Pro Today That's magazine, today. senior mm -hmm. editor. Always a pleasure to have you and your Thank Girl you Scout cookies on. I wish we could, well, we'll just have you in next time. We can have people yeah. in here with some Girl Scout cookies. Good. The sale season starts in January, so you'll know when to book Good. you next. We'll book you, we'll book you before <laughs> then, but it's great to have you. And it's always a pleasure to have my old friend Kevin Rose on. Just adore you, and I'm so happy for your beautiful family. And thank you for, and, and congratulations on the success of Modern Finance. That's great. Modern.finance oh, thank you, Leo. for his Appreciate new podcast. It. It's a must listen if you're interested in uh, the, the modern world of, of cryptocurrency, NFTs, FinCEN, is it Fin? what is it, Fin? DeFi. DeFi, that's it. Mm -hmm. What does that stand for? Decentralized finance. There you go. DeFi. That's, uh, that's how Nate and I grew up as teenagers. We defied. And now, <laughs> and now Kevin's making money on it. Thank you, Kevin. Great to have you. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC. We'd love to have you watch us live. There's a live stream. It's kind of fun. You have a live audience. Can't have them in studios. So watch us in the live stream. There's audio and video at twit.tv slash live. If you're watching live chat live, you can do that at irc.twit.tv. And, of course, Club Twit members chat live with us in our Discord uh, server. I'll explain Club Twit 
another time, but uh, it's a great place to hang out. Um, after the fact, on-demand versions of the show are available, of course, on our website, twit.tv. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to This Week in Tech. You can watch there. Uh, best way, probably, is to subscribe in your favorite podcast client. Uh, that way you'll get it automatically. If there is a chance on that client to leave a review, please tell the world you listen to Twit. Leave that five-star review. Help us spread the word. We appreciate it. Thanks in advance. Thanks for uh, your, uh, your time this afternoon, this evening, whenever you listen. And we'll see you next time. Another Twit is in the can. 17 years, I've been saying. This is amazing. It's nice.